Mm-hmm. Stefan, your recording is still working? Yeah, I know it's still working. Okay, but mine um, also. Well, I guess maybe you guys need to start first and then I need to, I don't know. Oh, you mean it's like set it? Uh-huh. Yeah, but one, because I'm the host, once maybe I start recording, maybe that, that or maybe, I don't know, I'm not sure. Now I started as a co-host, so okay, that's fine. Or shall we still um, stop the uh, recording before we um, pause the break? Okay, I we are what, in eight minutes? You guys were discussing something quite interesting, so. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, continue. Are, are you good. trying to make sure you do record all of the talks? Yeah, we have uh, not uh, only tried, I yeah. think we have succeeded you know, to... To make a perhaps a heterodox comment, it's not the worst thing in the world not to record every single thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes sometimes people say more interesting things when they know they're not being recorded. So just, uh, just, just are you planning to make uh, controversial talk. statements? Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, some people. <laughs> so so what you say? Say it now. You say it now. You Right. No. 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 Exactly. <laughs> yeah. No. I have a friend who uh, said something controversial and got a lot of trouble because people. <laughs> Uh, listen to his recording. Uh, never happened to me, of course, but it's happened to a friend of mine. <laughs> there you go. Hi, Tim. Hey, Atul, how's it going? Uh, good. Did you manage to come to my talk yesterday? I did, of course. Uh, model of your constraints as usual. Yeah, you know, uh, Finn had managed not to try and destroy himself for sort of uh, an hour in the morning, so life was good. Good. Hi, Tim. Hi, Tom. How's it? Yeah, I'll see you soon in person. That'll be cool. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm fine um, again. You know, I can, I can almost allow myself to believe that it will actually happen. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, I'm sending, I, how do you call it, like a test uh, test uh, pigeon. Mm-hmm. To, uh, today, my, my kid is flying. Ah, okay, excellent. <laughs> so we'll see how it goes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, two, uh, two passenger locator, two passenger locator farms, one for Ireland, where she's flying to Dublin, one through UK. There is a test, uh, a test here. Test uh, in Edinburgh, no, mm-hmm. Professor Andrews. It's like uh, then, before, yeah, it's quite a yeah, it's a bit of a a bit of a puzzle that one has to navigate. Uh, my parents actually came to visit not a couple weeks ago, and this was just like, uh, yeah, it was like some sort of escape room challenge, taking them all over the place to get tested, and then putting the test. You 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 can put your test in the mail, uh, which is pretty easy. But not in any mailbox. There's special mailboxes you have to put your t- <laughs> so you have to find the special mailbox. It's a bit of yeah, Royal sort mail, of exciting. Uh, yeah, some express service. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. 
We yeah, we need to make sure we get Lionel tested before he comes to Edinburgh. Just it's just riddled with COVID. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, he survived. So it's nice. I mean, yeah, in some sense he's he's immune now. <laughs> he's immune now. Lionel yeah. got COVID? Just recently, yes. No kidding. <laughs> oh, brutal. This, I mean, Lionel's one of like the news stories, like post double vaccination and everything. Um, so yeah. No way. Yeah. Wow. What, he just what, got what, lots what, of what, taste. Where, where did he get it? Maybe. Does he know? Ed, is he okay? Scotland. Actually, yeah. Is he okay? Yeah. Yeah, he yeah. He's fine. I, I mean, yeah. He's. He, I think he's. Well, he's probably going to turn up at some point. He can tell you himself. But the uh, yeah, I think I think he's fine. Uh, I mean, I've heard all sorts of theories. One of the theories is that Hadley Frost gave it to him. Oh, it's not crazy because Hadley had this insane thing. Hadley had this brutal, brutal thing that he claimed was not COVID for sure, for sure not not COVID. But he was knocked out for like 10 days, it looked like. Uh, and uh, I see. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and that, and, and maybe that, 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 that was... Uh, that was the thought about what it was. Is that right? No, no. I, 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 I think this is just a joke. No, I think Lionel knows it wasn't okay. Hadley. Uh, this is just yeah. some joke. He took a I'm vacation gonna, gonna to Scotland, Google right? Hadley the next time I talk to him. I'm, I'm talking to him in a couple of days. So I'll, I'll tell him that, you know, this is not the way to open up positions, academic positions. Yeah, you know, that's by, right. By like, taking out the senior faculty. Very literally. Yeah, it's I know it's a They'll have to replace him with fantasy. someone, right? It's <laughs> I know it's kind of a fantasy, but it's one of those fantasies that you should not act on. You know, there are other ways, there are better ways of doing it. There are yeah, actually, yeah, exactly. There are exactly. not that many better ways of doing it. <laughs> oh. oh, amazing. Yeah. In fact, Lionel did not go to Roger's 80, uh, 90th birthday party because he was on vacation just two days before he came back. <laughs> Otherwise, oh, he would have infected everyone in that birthday party. Wow. Holy crap. Yeah, that wow. wouldn't have been great. Um, that would not, not have been great. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, brutal. All right. Well, I'm glad he's OK. Uh, I, I mean, um, uh, how does he know for sure he has it? it was, uh, so I think, and again, Lionel can probably tell you the story than me but i think he was actually supposed to fly to poland for like a gr conference and his yeah. pre-departure test came back positive oh, it wasn't God. even a pre-departure test he just decided to take a voluntary oh, really? test because there is no pre-departure requirement for poland oh for real okay yeah so, um but anyway yeah and then i think he did develop symptoms but i don't think they were too severe or no. anything no, yeah. no. Beautiful. No, he almost infected me, but uh, it seems he didn't. So it's fine. I'm alive. What 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 was his double vaccine? Which which vaccine was it? Was it AstraZeneca? Yeah. So over here, I guess it must have been AstraZeneca. Yeah. I think if you're if you were over forty, you got AstraZeneca over here. Um. Yeah. So it must have been. Lionel, of course, being just over forty yeah. years old. I had. Uh, I talked to like six. Uh, I I I just personally know six cases over the last week of people who were double vaccinated and got it okay and they had a Pfizer and they were yeah with okay so there is no uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. doesn't seem to be any sample but were they symptomatic or no no the the, the point is no that they no were symptom. it was never anything really very serious okay so one person got better like uh, well one person other had asthma so she got a little bit uh, you know some little bit of asthma attacks but everybody else who who i know it was very mild who was vaccinated so that from that point of view it works yes but it's cool about travel plan yes, that's what yeah, I'm, that's, that's fine yeah that's no more fine. yoga it's... for me today for, for the next week <laughs> No, hot yoga. <laughs> so I guess we should start him. Do you want to try your, your screen? Yeah, of course. Um, let's see. Is that working? Uh, yes. Um, maybe you go full screen. Or... How about that? Mm -hmm. Is that working? Okay, cool. Yeah, fine, yeah.
So Let's try the Zoom change. windows again. The black spot. Is it still there, Atul? The top mm, one yeah. is still there, so maybe you can move it. Yeah, how do I move that? Ah, oh, there we go. Um, well, no, it's still there, isn't it? Now it's just in the middle of the screen, right? Yes, now it's in the middle of the screen. Sorry. Is it a matter of um, internet connection? Somehow? No, no, is it, is it working now? I mean, yeah, no, yes, it's all the, there's no uh, black. Okay, box. cool. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. I just needed to wait for it to go away. So, uh -huh. okay, so are you ready? Yep, yep, ready when you are. Very good. So let's let's continue. Um, so it's a pleasure to have uh, Tim Adamo here at our workshop, and uh, he's going to talk about celestial OPEs from the world sheet. Okay, so thanks very much, and for the opportunity to speak here. Um, I'll say straight away, uh, because of my setup here, I can't see anyone else. So if you have questions, just interrupt me um, because assume that I can't see your, your uh, digitally raised hand. Um, okay, so today I'm gonna tell you about some work I've been doing with uh, Wei Bu, who's a student here in Edinburgh, um, and Eduardo Casali and Atul Sharma, who I guess most of you uh, know already. Um, and hopefully if we get our acts together, this is something that will uh, appear in the next month uh, or so. So, okay, uh, without further ado, uh, let me start with a bit of motivation, which probably isn't really necessary for this, uh, for this audience, but um, so, so far this week and uh, for the rest of this week, I guess we'll be hearing uh, a lot about these hints that there's some uh, potential uh, celestial CFT, you know, that lives at null infinity or on the celestial sphere at null infinity, that's supposed to be a kind of dynamic dual to, uh, asymptotically flat gravity. And uh, I think it's fair to say, although perhaps some people might uh, disagree with this, that these hints uh, usually come in uh, one of two different flavors. Either they're somehow kinematic or imposed by symmetries, or in some sense, you can find them for free by taking some known uh, expression or behavior of say scattering amplitudes in momentum space and then Mellon transforming it to a, to a conformal primary basis. And so in some sense, I think hopefully lots of us would agree that uh, in, uh, an important question in this area is can we, can we actually generate any, anything dynamically here? So uh, in, a, in a way that uh, isn't kind of gotten for free by kinematics or by symmetries, or um, by just Mellon transforming something that we already knew in, uh, in momentum space. And uh, so, okay, an important example of one of these hints that I'm talking about, which we've heard about many times uh, already this week, are uh, some OPE coefficients uh, in this putative uh, celestial CFT. So let's take the particular example of um, some, uh, some plus or minus helicity, let's just say outgoing to fix a convention once and for all. Uh, conformal primary gluons, which are inserted at some points on the celestial sphere. And uh, the OPE limit of these things on the, the S2, the celestial sphere, this is sort of like taking a collinear limit in momentum space. And that means that you can determine some explicit CFT data. So in particular, some, some OPE coefficients uh, when these things get close to each other. So uh, when they're the same helicity, the OPE coefficients given by a beta function with another of the same helicity uh, gluon insertions uh, with its conformal weight shifted in a certain way. And when you have mixed helicity uh, OPEs, there are two terms uh, that you get at leading order. Uh, one of them gives you one helicity, is, is proportional to one of the helicity gluons, the other one's proportional to the other helicity gluon, and it depends whether you're thinking of 
uh, the OPE singularity is kind of being a holomorphic or anti-holomorphic one uh, on the celestial sphere. So of course we've seen these expressions many, many times uh, this week already. So uh, the story I'd like to tell you about today is a way to generate these OPE coefficients using an actual conformal field theory. Um, and the conformal field theory we're gonna use is a world sheet description of gauge theory or gravity in asymptotically flat space times, which is called an ambitwister string, uh, although I'm gonna be uh, play fast and loose with that term uh, as, we'll, as we'll see. And the idea is that conformal primary wave functions or celestial gluons or gravitons, these are represented in this world sheet theory by certain vertex operators. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the world sheet OPE limit of these, uh, these vertex operators. And it's gonna turn out that this actually corresponds to the OPE limit on the celestial sphere. And it will generate for us uh, the correct, oops, sorry, am I hearing someone? Going once, going twice? No, okay. Uh, this will generate for us the correct uh, OPE coefficients um, through the kind of dynamics of the, the, the world sheet CFT. So that's the plan. Um, so let's uh, let's let's get after it. Um, so I said that these world sheet theories are called ambitwister strings. And so for the uninitiated, what what is uh, an ambitwister or what is ambitwister space? Well, uh, basically you just need to think of this as the space of complexified null GD6, say in Minkowski space, considered up to scale. But if you like to think about things at null infinity, what this really is is the cotangent bundle of the complexification of scry quotiented by a scale. So that just means you take a point at scry, complexified scry, and then pick a null direction, right? And of course, that's the same as picks it, picking a complexified null GED stick up to scale in the space time. And in four dimensions, which is where we're gonna be uh, having our discussion, at least for the purposes of this talk, uh, this space, this uh, ambitwister space, or if you like the cotangent, but complexified cotangent bundle of scry considered up to scale, this is parameterized by uh, a quadric in CP3 cross CP3. So let's take two sets of homogeneous uh, coordinates, uh, say ZA on one CP3 and WA on the other dual CP3. And then we subject them to this condition that Z dot W is, is equal to zero. And uh, so uh, you might ask, well, okay, how are these sort of twister or dual twister like variables related to coordinates that you might know and love on scry? So the, the, the answer is that they give kind of a, a homogeneous coordinate system on Scry, which has been known since, uh, or studied since the 80s, uh, well known if you drink uh, the right sort of Kool-Aid, I guess. But, um, but basically uh, the lambda and lambda twiddle parts of the twister and dual twister, these give homogeneous coordinates on the complexified sphere of null directions or celestial sphere at Scry. And then the Bondi time coordinate, U, um, this is just given by taking contractions, spinner contractions of mu with lambda twiddle or lambda with mu twiddle. And the equality, uh, the equivalence of those definitions is guaranteed by this quadric condition that w is equal to zero. Okay, but in any case, uh, you should hear ambitwister space and just think space of complexified null GD6 considered up to scale. Okay, so what are these ambitwister strings? These are just 2D conformal field theories that govern holomorphic maps from a closed Riemann surface to this ambitwister space. And so uh, from the perspective of the world sheet, we let our, the world sheet fields are these, uh, these homogeneous coordinates, Z and W. And we say that on the world sheet, they're gonna be spinner valued. So they take uh, values in the square root of the canonical bundle. And then one writes down a kind of chiral first order uh, world sheet action for them. But then you need to gauge uh, the quadrant constraint Z dot W to make sure that these, uh, these maps are actually landing on ambi twister space and not just CP3 cross CP3. And then you can modify this basic action that I've written here by uh, various choices of, of, of matter fields. And the basic idea is that uh, picking different um, matter fields corresponds to uh, picking different uh, space-time field theories that you're gonna describe. So today I'm just gonna focus on Yang-Mills theory and that means that we'll take this S matter to be a world sheet current algebra, say for a gauge, gauge group SUN of level K, okay? So uh, to quantize this model, you have to first of all fix the various symmetries that are in place. So there's a GL1 
uh, symmetry, a uh, gauge symmetry corresponding to the gauge field that uh, fixes the quadric uh, Z dot W constraint. So we can set that to zero, at least locally. And you can also fix conformal gauge, which is like gauging holomorphic world sheet gravity. And this gauge fixing, uh, so in, in principle, there, there are anomalies uh, when, you, when you quantize the model. So a, conformal, a holomorphic conformal anomaly and a GL1 uh, anomaly, and of course a mix, potentially a mixed anomaly. But uh, if you allow yourself the freedom to kind of dial up and down uh, some sort of target supersymmetry in MB twister space, and also tune the rank and, uh, and level of your world sheet current algebra, you can always get rid of these, uh, these anomalies. But when you're living just at genus zero, um, in some sense, these anomalies aren't terribly important. They can always be removed kind of by hand, at least at the level of calculations of things that we're interested in. Sorry. Who calls a landline anymore? Hello? Okay. Um, so uh, the, the fact that's important to take away uh, about these models is that uh, they describe when the world sheet is restricted to genus zero, uh, tree level four-dimensional Yang-Mills theory, provided you send the level of the world sheet current algebra to zero. Now, uh, if you know anything about world sheet current algebras, you know that the level actually has to be a positive integer for the world sheet current algebra to be globally well-defined. But uh, so in some sense, you should just view this level going to zero uh, constraint as a kind of formal uh, prescription that one gives after computing, say, correlators uh, in the world sheet CFT. Basically, what it ends up doing is it, it decouples uh, gravitational degrees of freedom, which are in the model and which are, in fact, non-unitary. So you send this level k equal to zero, and it ensures that you just have kind of Yang-Mills uh, degrees of freedom uh, in the kind of target space effective theory. And so the, the only world sheet OPEs, then, that you have to worry about in the model are the simple OPE between the Z and the W fields and the OPE between uh, world sheet currents, which uh, in full generality, there'd be a double pole term there, but that's proportional to the level. And we've said we're gonna set the level kind of formally equal to zero. So there's just a simple pole there that's uh, proportional to the structure constants of the gauge group. Okay, so these are the only OPEs you have to worry about. And uh, so positive and negative helicity gluons are represented in this model by vertex operators. And basically these vertex operators take the form where you, you have an integral. So they're integrated vertex operators say over uh, the world sheet. Then you take one of these uh, uh, currents for your gauge group, J, and then you uh, wedge that with a, uh, a wave function, which is either on twister space, so on just a function of the Z variables or on dual twister space. So just a function of the W variables. And that choice dictates whether uh, you have a, a positive helicity gluon or a negative helicity gluon. And so uh, making specific choices for what those twister or dual twister representatives are uh, tells you, uh, you, you, can, you can choose what kind of basis you want your states to be. And so we're interested in uh, this conformal primary basis and you can write down very explicitly what these, uh, these kind of twister or dual twister wave functions are uh, for, for fixed uh, delta and fixed insertion point Z, Z bar, say on the celestial sphere. So I've written them here, but let's just unpack a little bit uh, what the ingredients uh, in this formula are. So here, Z alpha and Z bar alpha dot, these are just homogeneous coordinates on the celestial sphere. So if you prefer working with the, uh, Z, Z bar, that's of course just a coordinate patch. You just remove the North Pole or the South Pole on your celestial sphere. Um, this parameter S, that's a non-vanishing complex number. This is just an affine scaling parameter, parameter that ensures that the, uh, the kind of twister or dual twister wave function has the correct homogeneity. And there's some gamma function that sits out in front. And of course there's some infinite series of poles uh, coming from that. And these are, of course, just the poles that you expect from uh, the infinite tower of conformal uh, soft theorems, which, of course, we've heard lots about uh, already this week. So the basic idea of the calculation we want to do is to take two of these vertex operators and bring them close to each other uh, on the world sheet. Now, what we already know, uh, without having to do any more calculations, is that if you just took a correlation function of all these vertex operators in the world sheet CFT defined by the ambi-twister string. We know when that 
when the world sheet is genus zero, we know that that gives us the full tree level S matrix of, uh, of Yang Mills theory written in the conformal primary basis. So we already know that the world sheet theory is gonna give us the right, uh, the right amplitudes. And so we know therefore that the correlators uh, of the, the world sheet theory will of course inherit the correct, uh, inherit the correct soft and collinear behavior uh, from momentum space. So the usual Mellon transform yoga will mean that they have to have the correct uh, kind of uh, celestial OPE limits as well. However, the calculation we're proposing is, is more non-trivial than this because we're not gonna look at a correlation function. We're gonna look at the raw OPE between vertex operators. So this isn't gonna be happening inside of the path integral. We're just gonna take two of these vertex operators and take their OPE with each other. Um, so it's not happening inside of a correlation function or inside of a path integral. And a priori, there's no reason at all why the OPE limit on the world sheet should necessarily have anything to do with the OPE limit uh, on, on the celestial sphere. So uh, on the one hand, you might say, well, this is, a, this is a kind of trivial calculation. You have to get the right answer. But Wait, I would sorry. argue- you, you said you said to do, d w wouldn't that seem to follow from the fact that the, um, the positions on the on the world sheet are pinned to the positions on the the scattering equations pinches pins the world sheet positions to the uh, cel celestial positions. So it doesn't it doesn't uh, for for generic insertion point it doesn't pin them to the to the to the positions. So if I look at this uh, a so lambda alpha here this will be a function of sigma the position on the world sheet. All this delta function says is that lambda alpha is proportional to the position on uh, the celestial sphere. Lambda alpha in general will be some complicated function of sigma. Um, so the, the, these delta functions are not telling you that sigma is identified with Z position on the, on the celestial sphere. Now, what we'll end up seeing is that in the OPE limit, it turns out that they are identified. Yeah, but um, is it for, it's also for MH, uh, isn't it for MHV will get, uh, uh, that will be the case that. Uh... So, okay, so so in some sense, you're right. Uh, although answering this question maybe opens up a little bit of a can of worms. So in, in some sense, a twisting of these ambitwister string models will give you the Berkowitz witten twister string, which is graded by degree. And in MHV, the degree of the map is one, so that lambda is a linear map, which means that lambda essentially can be identified with sigma, in which case the delta functions would indeed tell you that Z and sigma can be identified. In these ambitwister string models, there is no grading by degree. Uh, so there's no additional line bundle floating around uh, whose zero nodes, if you like, you have to sum over. But in some sense, what you're saying is correct. Does that, does that answer uh, yes, the various yes. questions? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so uh, let's start with the same helicity uh, OPE. So let me just show you again the, uh, these, these vertex operators. So if I take, say, two positive helicity vertex operators, there's no uh, twister twister, so capital Z, capital Z. There's no OPE between those fields. So the only non-trivial OPE to worry about in this same helicity case is the JJ OPE in the world sheet current algebra, which will generate this simple pole, uh, sigma IJ, uh, which is just sigma i minus sigma j there on the second line. Um, and so then you're left with kind of something that you have two integrals over world sheet positions and then two of these scale integrals. And uh, what you see here is that in the world sheet OP limit as sigma ij goes to zero, the delta functions that are left over here are telling you exactly what you want to know, which is that uh, holomorphically zij on the celestial sphere is also going to zero. So in this OPE limit, indeed, the delta functions are telling you that uh, collision of the insertion points on the sort of abstract world sheet Riemann sh sphere coincides with collision of the insertion points, uh, sorry, collision of the celestial gluons uh, on the celestial sphere. So that's exactly what we wanted to see. But now the idea is uh, to isolate this OPE limit we use the fact that these, these holomorphic delta functions, I mean, they're basically defined like, uh, you know, with respect to the Cauchy kernel. So they're D bar of one over their arguments. 
And that means we can integrate by parts with respect to one of those D bars, and that will allow us to perform one of the scale integrals explicitly. And when we integrate by parts with respect to sigma i, we'll get a delta function in sigma ij, which will allow us to do one of the world sheet integrals explicitly. So the idea is basically you just use uh, these holomorphic delta functions to perform uh, some of your integrals explicitly. Uh, if you don't like holomorphic delta functions and want to think instead of some sort of check prescription rather than a Dolbo prescription, this is just doing a contour deformation. So you've picked out one pole, which is like the scattering equation, this zi minus si lambda at sigma i, and you're deforming it uh, to, to encircle the other pole, which is the OPE limit uh, on the world sheet. So in any case, you do this, it's a fairly straightforward calculation, and this is what you find. Um, you wind up with uh, some additional auxiliary reference spinner that I've called C here, which is basically used to do one of the, the, the S integrals, one of the scale integrals. And um, this is just to make sure that the expression has the correct homogeneity. It's almost arbitrary. Uh, the reason why there's an almost there is that that S integral was an affine parameter integral. So it wasn't global. And that means that if you pick a, a bad value of C here, you'll introduce some zeros or infinities into this expression that shouldn't actually be here. So basically, C is arbitrary, provided you don't introduce any new zeros uh, or infinities. Um, now, the idea here is that you now take these two uh, square bracket factors in the denominator, turn them into exponentials using a, a Mellon integral, and then make an auspicious choice for C, auspicious and legal choice for C. And then you can do your Mellon integrals and the remaining scale integral explicitly. And lo and behold, you find uh, the beta function, which is exactly what you want, over zi minus zj. So you reproduce on the nose uh, the correct celestial uh, OPE coefficient. So uh, great. Sounds like, uh, like the machine is doing what we wanted it to do. But uh, what about the mixed helicity case? Now, it turn, turns out this, this is actually much more complicated, albeit for a relatively straightforward reason. So um, it's no longer the case when you take mixed helicity OPEs that the only thing you have to worry about is the JJ or world sheet current algebra OP. Now you have Zs and Ws in both of your wave functions and they talk to each other. And so when you take the OPE, you get this sort of God awful looking mess uh, here, where you've had to introduce some Mellon parameter integrals to even compute the OP in the first place. And uh, so, point of showing you that expression isn't for you to parse it in its entirety because it's a mess. Uh, it looks like a mess and it is a mess. If you try to do the calculation the same way that we did it for the same helicity case, uh, you get rubbish answers. You find zero or infinity. Um, and there's a reason for this it's because the world sheet OPE is now probing regions where the affine parameter integrals, this S and S twiddle, these are the things that make sure that the wave functions have the correct homogeneity, where they're not good affine coordinates. So you're like taking yourself out of the coordinate patch on the moduli space uh, where you've, uh, you've chosen to express uh, the various uh, wave functions that you're doing the computation in. So uh, the idea is, uh, to try and change variables to a different legitimate affine coordinate patch where you don't run into these problems. And it turns out that there's actually quite a beautiful way of doing that uh, called the twister or dual twister transform. This is basically just a, a Fourier transform which takes you from twister variable Z to dual twister variables W or vice versa. So it's just an integral transform. And the reason, um, and maybe I'll just wax lyrical here for a second about, the, the, the reason why this works um, is because in the same helicity case, we didn't run into this problem. And what the twister transform does is it takes uh, the calculation and makes it look in an affine patch like it's the same helicity calculation. So uh, that's, that's the sort of moral for why this is the right, uh, the right thing to do. Um, and it acts directly on the, you could use it just to act directly on the wave functions if you like before you took the, uh, the OPE limit. But uh, the basic recipe is that we take that horrible messy expression for the OPE between the positive and negative helicity gluon vertex operators, apply the twister transform to it. So that will take us to some new coordinate patch on the, on the moduli space. Uh, it'll give us some new definition of the, the affine variables that are causing us problems. 
in this patch, we perform the one of the world sheet and one of the scale parameter integrals against the delta functions, just like we did in the same helicity calculations. And then we take the inverse transform to get back to Andy Twister space. And lo and behold, uh, the result is one of the correct uh, terms in the celestial OPE. And sure enough, the delta functions that were there at the beginning tell us that as the world sheet points collide, anti-holomorphically, the points on the celestial sphere collide. The point is that there are two patches, and the other one is given by using the dual twister transform. So the total answer is given by summing over both patches, that is covering the relevant portion of the moduli space. And lo and behold, uh, when you do the dual twister version of that calculation, you get the complementary uh, OPE coefficient. So again, you just generate the, the, the correct answers uh, for yourself using only the kind of dynamics of the world sheet CFT. So, I mean, of course it would be dishonest to, I mean, we only looked for this once uh, we were told that uh, what these what these OPE coefficients were, but my, I guess the, the point I want to emphasize is that uh, one could have done this calculation with no input uh, and you would have derived these OPE coefficients from, from the ambi twister string. So, uh, okay, so in the interest of time, I, I won't bore you with too many other details, but let me just tell you what else we can do sort of following this general roadmap here. I mean, I presented everything for kind of all outgoing uh, gluons, but of course we can do mixed in-out configurations and we get the right answers there as well. Um, we could also take a different choice of matter fields uh, on the world sheet to generate graviton answers. And it turns out that story is a bit more subtle than this because the problems one runs into in mixed uh, helicity OPs are worse. The basic reason for that is that you have some world sheet supersymmetry, which means that graviton vertex operators uh, involve derivatives of wave functions. And that means that the screwed upness you run into when you take the mixed helicity OP is much worse. So there's some different gymnastics, slightly different gymnastics one has to go through uh, to isolate the correct affine patch, but it works and you generate the correct celestial OPE coefficients. And something that I think is sort of remarkable, I don't know if my collaborators or indeed if anyone else uh, is as surprised about this as I am, is that we also get the correct gluon graviton celestial OPE coefficient. So take one of the vertex operators that I wrote down for you today, and one of these graviton vertex operators that I didn't write down for you, take their OPE in the way I've described, and uh, I claim that you'll get the correct uh, celestial OPE coefficient for Einstein Young Mills. Uh, the reason why I think this is, surpri is surprising is because we don't know an ambi twister string for Einstein Yang Mills. <laughs> so uh, somehow that's saying that the details of the world sheet theory aren't even that important. It's really just the structure of ambi twister space uh, that, that, that matters somehow, at least, at least at the level of these kind of uh, leading OPE coefficients. So anyway, I'm happy to talk more about that later if people are interested. Um, but also, of course, you could phrase this whole story um, not in terms of conformal primary wave functions, but instead just in terms of momentum eigenstates. And there, uh, the story runs essentially the same. And the things that you generate instead of celestial OPE coefficients are, of course, the, all the well-known collinear splitting functions. Uh, and if one's interested in kind of conformal descendants or subleading contributions to the world sheet OPE, uh, at least some of these you can also recover uh, just using, uh, not the the, to the celestial OP, you can, you can also generate some of these using the world sheet OP. The reason why I say only some is that some of the conformal descendant contributions rely on your vertex operators, the two that you're bringing close together, talking to other vertex operators in a correlation function. And the whole point of the calculation we've done here is that it's not inside a correlation function, we've just taken two vertex operators and brought them close together on the world sheet. So if you allowed yourself to sort of take this limit inside of a correlator with other vertex operators, you would be able to generate all of the uh, conformal descendant contributions. So uh, where to next? So I think, I mean, there's, there's of course many, many, many things to explore, uh, I think with these world sheet theories, uh, but um, I guess to be maybe a little bit deliberately provocative for me, I guess the question is using these world sheet theories. So ambi twister strings, what have you, I mean, 
Lionel uh, Mason earlier today talked about certain sigma models you can write down, uh, which if you like govern maps from Riemann spheres to twister space. So you could ask the same question about them. Can we make predictions that can't simply be deduced from symmetries or by Mellon transforming momentum space results? So that is to say, could, could we generate something um, that, that isn't known yet and that it's not obvious how to, how to find out? And I, I mean, okay, of course I believe that that's true, but I don't have any uh, maybe bright ideas as to, as to what that calculation might be yet. Maybe my collaborators do. Um, but anyway, let me, let me conclude uh, with a sort of not so subtle advertisement. So if you just can't get enough of, uh, of celestial CFT, then believe it or not, there's another uh, workshop about this happening in Edinburgh uh, in a couple of weeks. And I know some of you uh, know about this already, but if you don't and you'd like to join, then you should register uh, on that website. So anyway, thanks very much for your time. Okay, thank you very much for your um, nice talk, Tim. Um, so we have time for questions. Yeah, can I ask a question? Sure, yeah, Tom. Okay, so uh, could you repeat how, uh, you know, the uh, delta, the uh, dimension appears, uh, you know, in, in the usual formulation, it appears as a variable just to work to energy. So how do you, could you repeat how do you get uh, that in your formulation, where this dimension is coming from? Where the delta comes from. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, okay, there's there's a very simple way uh, to, to think about it, which is just you can write down vertex operators in the ambitwister string for a momentum eigenstate. And you just melon transform them. And delta is just the power that you use in your melon transform. But it's just it's just a quantum number, uh, the same way that it would be when you think of it as solving a but free then, field but equation then, in but some then cases. It, would it mean that automatically it produce, uh, the, uh, it produce Mellon amplitudes? I mean, yeah, would... yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so, so sorry, I should have been uh, more, more clear about this. So uh, earlier on, I was saying that in some sense, you might think that this is an obvious calculation. And that's what I meant in the sense that you know that the ambitwister string will give you the correct amplitudes. And so if you just melon transform the vertex operators, it follows that it will give you the melon transformed amplitude. So that, that is obvious, I, I would say, at, at least. Um, but it's not obvious how that's going to play with world sheet OPs in this kind of quasi off shell formalism where you're not inside uh, a correlation function where you don't have the path integral to kind of constrain everything that's, uh, that's happening. Does, does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Okay, then uh, Andy has a question. Uh, yeah. Should it also be true for fundamental world sheet string theory that the, um, the world sheet OPE of vertex operators that create conformal primary strings and conformal primary states is equal to the their celestial OPs? Um, uh, okay, so yeah, yeah, I'm embarrassed to say it's an ob sort of an, uh, seems like an obvious question. I don't, I don't actually know off the top of my head. The only thing I think you could worry about is because the, how to say this properly. So in, in string theory, because you have an XX OP. So in, in principle, you have kind of non-polynomial wick contractions between vertex operators. So what I would have said was that you might worry you get some sort of quite high uh, multiplicity poles when you take the OPE, but I guess all you need to do is say isolate the correct uh, the the correct power pole. So in some sense, I would say yes, uh, that, that 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 should also be true. Um, but I, okay, uh, I haven't I haven't done the calculation myself, but but it, it I think it should probably work. Should uh, that works. It, it should be true at the level of the amplitude, at least, because the boundary of moduli space that you access should correspond to the three particle factorization. I mean, I, I certainly agree that, um, right? Yeah, at the level, but again, at the level of the amplitudes, I think these statements are sort of obvious because uh, the amplitude is the amplitude and it, you know, it's so tightly constrained. Um, right. Just at the level of the OPE, um, yeah, I don't, I mean, 
what do I want to say? I mean, if you take two e to the i k dot x's in string theory and just let them talk to each other, you generate a Koba Nielsen factor, right? Um, but it's, I mean, it's not, to get the Koba Nielsen factor in its vanilla form, there's some zero mode integral that you have to do, right? Uh, so it, you know, it will be slightly more complicated than that. But, but, but that Koba Nielsen factor is, you know, not a rational function of the kinematic data. So there may be some subtlety associated with extracting uh, the kind of pole that you want to, to drill yourself down to this, uh, this kind of collinear or celestial OPE limit, but maybe maybe I just have the wrong end of the stick, and I'm, uh, I'm completely completely wrong. Um, any more? Any? Do you still have a question? Or okay, um, I don't see any more questions. So we thank uh, Tim again. And uh, I think we can directly move on to the uh, panel yeah. discussion. I need only one name, um, Srikant, uh, is it? Yeah, it's, ah, um, okay. Hi, uh, it's me. Perfect. So we Sorry, had, um, so originally we had, um, so the discussion will panel will be with Nima and uh, Sebastian, but um, uh, since on Monday we had some discussions on differential equations, we, uh, we um, thought that we, there will be also a 10 minute um, presentation by Ashkai um, Srikant on differential equation and, and Anastasia actually suggested that she should, he should be the first. Uh, um, so maybe you, um, you start um, as a presentation. Yeah. If... Is that, uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Um, so sh shall I start? Yeah, I think you can start. So you have 10 minutes. Hi. Um, so yeah, I first want to start by thanking the organizers for a uh, wonderful workshop. Um, yeah, as, uh, so I, I will, it was best that I make a few comments about uh, the relationship between non-states and the celestial conformal field theory and, and um, the CFW shifts. So let me begin by setting the stage and introducing the characters. Um, so it's well known that we can define uh, leading and subleading um, soft gluon currents in the celestial sphere. And the word identities of these currents are nothing but the well known. Uh, and in addition, the leading soft current modes uh, satisfy a current algebra amongst themselves. Um, and this has also been well known. And it's interesting to see what the implications of these um, algebra are for amplitudes beyond the soft theorem. Um, there's, in addition, there's also an infinite tower of higher soft currents. Um, and it's been recently shown that they also form an algebra, but I'm not going to be talking about that here. Um, so a good place to look at uh, the implications of, of, of this algebra is to study MHV amplitudes. So the MHV sector is closed under taking soft limits. Um, this is because if you take the soft limit of a negative helicity gluon, you get zero. Um, because any tree amplitude with just uh, one negative helicity gluon is zero. And it was shown in, uh, in a paper by Banerjee and Koch in, in, in the last year that there are null states and the decoupling of these null states um, imposes some constraints on, on the MHV amplitudes. And uh, what I want to uh, emphasize here is that uh, in momentum space, uh, these same equations, um, when written out for the color ordered amplitudes, they look like they encode the transformation of the amplitude at the infinitesimal uh, BCFW shifts. And so let me spend the next few minutes elaborating these points. So let us first uh, uh, look at what the null state is and what the equation is. Um, so this, um, at the top of the page, you can see the OPE for two um, hard gluon operators. And one can obtain the OPE of a subleading soft current. 
by taking this limit in the obvious way. However, uh, you can also obtain the same OPE by extracting it from the subleadings of word identity. And it turns out that these two are not uh, obviously equal. And once we set them to be equal, you get an equation which looks like uh, some differential operator built out of the Zs um, acting on a hard uh, gluon operator is zero. So this is an operator equation and I can now insert it into uh, any correlation function. Uh, furthermore, if you just look at the state psi defined as D acting on O, you can see that it's a null state because it satisfies, uh, because it is annihilated by the Rasoro as well as the uh, leading soft current modes. Um, when I insert uh, this operator into a correlation function, um, it turns out that I get a differential equation for the MHV amplitude. Um, I should emphasize here that this is an equation for the complete amplitude, uh, which is uh, which, where, by which I mean this is not color ordered. Um, but in the amplitudes community, we are more used to dealing with uh, with color ordered partial amplitudes. So the first task is to decompose this equation into equations for the color ordered amplitude, and uh, the way we do this is by uh, decomposing the amplitude in the trace basis this way and extracting uh, the equation implied for uh, each partial amplitude uh, from, from this the equation. And uh, for the amplitude with the canonical ordering one to n, uh, the equation that we get is, uh, is written down here. Now this is still an equation in, in, in the celestial variables that is z and delta. And it's um, straightforward to translate this into momentum space variables. Um, and it turns out that the equation can be very compactly written um, in, in, in the form you see in the box. And uh, one interpretation of this is that the left-hand side implements an infinitesimal uh, BCFW shift, and the right-hand side is just the uh, response under the shift. Um, so I would like to end with, um, with two open questions. Um, it's certainly true that this looks like a BCFW shift, but the, uh, an important question is whether there is a more fundamental principle uh, which relates uh, this equation to the celestial amplitudes. Is, is there a reason why this equation is relevant um, for celestial amplitudes and why this corresponds to a null state? And is there an obvious way we can generalize this to NMHV and um, higher sectors? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So um, now we move on um, with our um, next panel speakers. So um, we have Sebastian and uh, Nima. Should, should, I, should I go first? Yeah, maybe uh, you go first or um, yeah, okay. Nima is okay with it. Yeah, I'm sure he doesn't mind. <laughs> no, 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 please, please go ahead. Okay, so it's a pleasure to have um, Sebastian here. He uh, has kindly agreed to to um, tell us his view on, on um, celestial amplitudes and open the discussion. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Stefan, and thanks to all the organizers. And also let me thank, uh, first of all, all of the speakers for their great talks, but also for suggesting many topics for the discussion. And let me emphasize that most of the topics that will be included here are very much open-ended, which I hope will spur even more uh, discussions than usual. And there will be no references, I'm sorry for that. Uh, so uh, let's start by just reviewing that uh, what we do in celestial amplitudes is a, effectively a change of basis from definite momentum to definite boost wave functions. Okay, so either diagonalizing this part of the, this part of the Poincaré group. And as everyone knows, the co concretely, we can translate the massless states on the left-hand side into these um, uh, celestial states. And as a, effectively, there's two ways of doing it, depending on which, in, with which kernel you smear um, uh, on the celestial sphere. And the first option is the principal basis, and the other option is the, uh, the, the shadow. Then what you do next is you identify disease with the coordinates on the celestial sphere, or really the celestial sphere integrated over the uh, scry up to uh, identifications that uh, uh, I'm sure everyone knows about. Uh, so actually one of the questions is that uh, if we apply this formalism to massive amplitudes, you, you would discover that this kernel becomes very complicated. 
uh, and that's essentially because we've diagonalized our SO2C with respect to either two bases, but uh, another option that you can take is you can consider uh, SU two bases of SO2C and then study induced representations of that into Poincaré. And that in principle should give you a version of that also for massive amplitudes. So I hope someone, someone can do that. Anyway, uh, at this stage, uh, you know, this is not yet any more holographic than the traditional formulation of the S matrix. So the real claim to fame of the celestial holography program is the existence of a well-defined theory on the on the null infinity. And actually at this stage, someone from the audience could ask, well, why not just formulate a theory on the three-dimensional uh, square plus or perhaps some regularization, you know, some large radius surface or something like this. And I would love to know the answer to these questions from some of the experts in the audience. In other, at any rate, uh, at this stage, it's common to say that the theory, whatever it is, it has to be exotic. And I think the standard sort of CFT point of view on that is that we find that the dimensions of your operators have to be complex and that leads uh, to all the, all, the, all the usual problems. However, the real exoticness of this theory comes from somewhere else. And it basically comes from the kinematics. Okay, so just the fact that uh, in a real experiment, scattering experiment that we uh, want to do is we, we want to impose the real scattering angles. And the effect that it has on the, uh, on the celestial sphere is that the, you know, the, the, the supposed correlators are supported only on certain patches of the CP1. So for example, if we have four points, the configuration in which you have the uh, vertex operators in, in, out, out, organized in this way, it's forbidden uh, because it would lead to a complex carrying angle. But the one in which you lace the, uh, uh, the vertex operators as in, out, in, out is the one that leads you to a well-defined correlator. Okay, and then you can repeat similar exercises at high multiplicity and you find, you find similar, uh, similar effects. So the thing to emphasize here is that uh, well, really, you cannot ignore the fact that you have these two different types of in and out operators, and the, the, that has to be somehow taken care of within your theory. And to uh, those of you who know about uh, QCD physics, or uh, really the soft collinear hector field theory, would know that, uh, you know, it certainly makes sense to talk about OPEs or the uh, collinear limits between in and in states, and similarly between in and out, sorry, out and out states, but the uh, uh, OPs between in and out states are supposed to be just ill-defined or not exist, essentially because of uh, some harmonization effects. And that, uh, that is known in the QCD literature as the glauber gluon effect. And I would be curious to know what could be an avatar of that uh, on the sphere as well. Well, it has, to, it has to have some bearing on the sphere as well. Okay, so to illustrate this at the level of a formula, let's look at the, by now, a classic example in which you just take an exchange of some massive scalars, and then you transform it on a sphere and you get this function. So what we've been talking on the previous slide is this is this set function that you see here, that some cross ratio has to be bigger than one or something like this. So at this stage, you can ask yourself, well, what is the way out of this problem? And at least uh, I could identify four ways out. The first one is uh, for speculations. The first one is the that, well, you're supposed to really formulate your CFT with some kind of selection rules that give rise to these, feet, the, these step functions or uh, some more complicated things at high multiplicity. And I don't really know what's the, what, what the concrete technical approach would be here. Another more, uh, uh, another obvious approach is to do analytic continuation in which you misidentify Z and Z bar, you upgrade Z bar to Z tilde. So you would be working on the product of two spheres. However, that also comes with a problem uh, with, in that, uh, as you can tell, the, this function is really not well defined on, the, on these two spheres because it's multivalued. Right? So we, you're really supposed to be working on the covering space and define your theory there. And perhaps, uh, you know, these kind of twister approaches that uh, Tim and Lionel were talking about could, could be a re resolution to that. Another option is to, to uh, consider the representation introduced by Casali and Pum, uh, in which you uh, represent your correlator as some differential operators acting on the, on the contact diagram. 
And uh, while that is very promising, it does not, it takes us away, a bit away from the CFT point of view because it puts the amplitude in a more like um, uh, momentum space uh, representation. And finally, as we've seen in a, in a beautiful talk of Tomasz on Monday, uh, perhaps you should just forget about all of that and stick with shadow correlators um, because they're supposed to be well-defined, uh, meaning single-valued on the, on the sphere itself. Okay, so what happens here is that if what you can do is, for example, you can shadow one of the operators and then as, as we've seen uh, uh, on Monday, the result of that is some simple hypergeometric functions organized in this, in this kind of in this kind of structure, which is automatically single valued. And that of course leads to many, many follow-up questions. What happens in string theory? Let me also emphasize the need for, you know, not just knowing individual correlators, but studying general features or general statements about higher derivative corrections, loop level, general multiplicity, just to make sure that the things that we we're finding is, are not, uh, you know, some accident that, that maybe happened at far point. So we need a lot of exa examples. Okay. So uh, at this stage, let, let us ask the question that has been already asked uh, many times before, how vi viable is non-perturbative approach, uh, non-perturbative bootstrap approach to uh, celestial holography. And of course, as, as we know, this, this, this has two, this can be realized in two different ways. One is basically translating the bulk constraints, the usual causality, locality, unitary, high energy growth uh, constraints and knowing what that implies, uh, what it entails on the celestial sphere. And the other option is to do more like CFT bootstrap and uh, talk about OPs crossing spectra and, and, and uh, bootstrap it this way. And of course, there's been a lot uh, in the literature in both directions. And I would love to hear uh, any comments about recent results in, in either of these. Okay, so then at this stage, someone from the audience could ask, well, how redundant, let's say we can realize both in our dream, um, then uh, how redundant should we expect the two types of constraints be? Okay, and th that basically effectively translates to the, to the following question. Uh, if there was a bulk boundary duality uh, in, in, this, in this holographic sense, uh, well, should we expect it to be a weak weak or a strong weak duality? Of course, if it's a weak weak, then the two types of constraints would be just translations of one another. If it would be strong weak, then we would be really nailing down the, the space of uh, observables on, in a much more constrained way. And once again, uh, uh, perhaps we can discuss if someone has some ideas about uh, you know, or intuition or some, some hints, why you, could we expect it to be strong weak? I would love to hear uh, those comments uh, in the discussions. Okay, at this stage, let me, let me just remind everyone about the obvious lessons from the S-matrix theory, that uh, it's very useful to compute things in the uh, split signature, as long as we know how to continuously relate that to uh, real physics. Um, so that would be great to, to understand as well on the sphere. And secondly, and more importantly, the knowledge of analytic properties, and this is something that is absolutely crucial to understand as a step zero in any bootstrap approach. Uh, in the flattest matrix uh, or the plane wave basis didn't come out of nowhere. There's a lot of things that we know, for example, about the high energy growth that came from LSZ based approaches, but really most of the, um, uh, most of the things that we know about analytic structure came from painstaking study of individual examples at low look, uh, orders. And that, that really cannot be overstated to, to that, that we really learn from the examples and that is something that we should probably uh, be looking into in the celestial uh, world as well. And that at this stage leads to a small catch-22 type of situation in that on the one hand to understand general analytic properties, we need examples, uh, uh, well, to understand what constraints we should be imposing in the first place. But on the other hand, the, uh, there's a conjecture that only the UV soft theories are thought to have well-defined celestial amplitudes. And currently we don't know many examples of such UV soft theories, perhaps we know one, so at this stage, you know, we'd be learning a lot of things from a one example about, you know, analytic properties from that one example, 
so it's difficult to expect that we might find some other ways of constraining UV well behaved theories if, if we're sort of training ourselves on, on, on such an example. Okay, another point of the discussion could be the role of twister or ambitwister string in the Celestial program. As we've heard from beautiful talks this morning, uh, uh, there's a lot to say there. So one thing to emphasize is that the, the worksheet uh, uh, is, is a CP1 itself. It, as we know, we've, knew, we've known from for almost 20 years, it's a branched cover of uh, the celestial sphere and it's pinned really at, at various places. So for example, at n equals four, the celestial, uh, sorry, the worksheet correlators are pinned to Z, the celestial directions. Uh, starting at five point, you also pin yourself to the antipodal point or to the opposite point. And starting at n equals six, you, you also have many, many other points with very complicated functions um, of, of sigmas. And then perhaps we can, we, we've already had a uh, great discussion after Lionel's talk this morning, and perhaps we can continue that discussion um, about in general, the topics of celestial OPEs and W plus one infinity symmetries. Let me also uh, reiterate uh, the question posed by Adamo a couple of min minutes ago, uh, uh, where to next? You know, can, we, can we make predictions that can be simply deduced from symmetries? Okay, and finally, as a, as a final uh, final slide, uh, there's also, of course, a lot that's happening in the low energy EFT or swampland constraints that uh, translated to the celestial uh, sphere. And here, one thing to emphasize is that we, you know, we, if we were supposed to be talking about theory of quantum gravity, we really cannot ignore massless loops in the, in those those approaches. And that famously has been a problem even in the plane wave basis. And it's sort of difficult to expect that that problem will be fixed by just thinking about the sphere. Uh, and the solution so far was to use the CART IR cutoff in, in those approaches. Other types of ideas that, um, that you might have is, well, perhaps we can avoid the infrared issues but by going to higher dimensions. In principle, it, it could teach us something new when we translate the known results in the larger than four. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also uh, a bit of a cop out because we're ignoring the IR issues, which are supposed to be central. Um, and similarly, you can, there's also something that, that can be said for the maximal subgra, and it would be interesting to see, to, to, to know what those kind of, what these kind of constraints have to, say when they're translated at the, in the celestial basis. Okay, so then as the final final slide, let me just uh, end on a positive note and uh, mention the, the also another obvious thing, which is that the constraints at the fixed angle scattering have been notoriously difficult to implement in the plane wave basis. So uh, we know, for example, a lot about the constraints coming from fixed uh, impact parameter uh, uh, scattering from dispersion relation story and, and all that. Uh, but the fixed angle has been notoriously difficult to implement. However, in celestial amplitudes, of course, those kind of constraints are supposed to be built in because, because the, that's by, almost by definition. So of course that leads us uh, possibly um, uh, to a real place uh, to shine for, for celestial amplitude. So with that, let me thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Sebastian, for your um, presentation and um, very interesting um, points. So now I, I think we directly go over to Nima. Alrighty, can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, I'm, I'm gonna uh, uh, just write in uh, real, real, real time. So um, uh, here, uh, can you see my screen okay? Now we see your um, pet. Oh, you see my head. All right. Well, that's not so good. Hold on a sec. Uh, how about now? Yeah, we see the, the notepad. All right, great. Very good. Okay. 
All right. Um, so I'm just going to uh, say a uh, few things. Um, uh, uh, and I, I apologize that I, I, I wasn't around for the first couple of days of this uh, of this uh, uh, meeting. Um, so if some of the things have been said before or, or talked about uh, at a lot greater length and better, I, I apologize. Um, so um, uh, I want to make uh, just a, a, a few comments um, on some some uh, sort of two things. One, uh, just uh, some uh, some some quite sort of uh, concrete, uh, uh, pretty accessible uh, uh, questions um, uh, that are uh, quite close to things that have already been explored in this. Uh, um, uh, and and these are really still in the direction of these are really still in in, in the direction of uh, learning about celestial amplitudes, um, getting more data, learning about celestial amplitudes, uh, and uh, translating things from the usual momentum space. Um, uh, but uh, then uh, what I uh, want to really talk about are uh, 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 the the really new opportunities um, uh, for things that uh, thinking in terms of celestial amplitudes uh, uh, can give us for uh, addressing the sort of basic biggest uh, holographic uh, question here for the uh, for the, for holography in flat space, um, uh, which is really equal to the question: uh, What is the question? Uh, to which the amplitudes are answers. And I want to um, uh, I want to remind you of what what has always struck me as some fundamental stumbling blocks in the sort of biggest possible picture <laughs> for uh, thinking about this in the context of uh, momentum space amplitudes and how um, uh, thinking in terms of uh, uh, Celestial amplitudes might might uh, give us the the right idea uh, and tell us the right right thing to do. But let me sort of just start with part one, um, which are just uh, uh, a few obvious uh, uh, directions. Um, the first thing uh, uh, is almost kinematics, uh, and I think this is sort of one of the wonderful things about the uh, celestial amplitude program is that. Things that are almost kinematics on the celestial sphere, kinematics and symmetries on the celestial sphere, are dynamics uh, from the point of view, from the usual point of view of uh, amplitude, sort of most famously in the context of soft theorems. Of course, uh, we also understand soft theorems as almost being something uh, kinematical, following from gauge invariance or, uh, or equivalent in different uh, formulations. Um, but I think it's uh, undeniable that uh, that the that the symmetry phrasing of subleading and subleading uh, of uh, leading and subleading soft limits um, on the celestial sphere is really uh, something uh, very beautiful and uh, important. Hey, um, um, Nima, yeah. I'm really really sorry. I just want to check: Are you writing something? Uh, yes, I am. You can't see me writing. No, I can't. Ah, can, can anyone okay. else? Well, thank you very much for stopping me then. Uh, so I am writing. Um, and let me, uh, can you see now? Yes, now we see it. All right, thank you very much. I, 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 uh, I really appreciate it. All right, so, so I'm talking about uh, something which is um, a still almost uh, kinematics. And um, this begins, uh, so, so the sort of big question here is the, is the SUSY version um, of soft theorems. And here, I think there is an interesting uh, opportunity. So we know, let me jump all the way to n equals eight supergravity. Uh, and n equals eight uh, uh, supergravity, of course, we have the soft graviton um, and, uh, and uh, uh, with any amount of uh, uh, Suzy and soft gravitini theorems. But we know that there's actually more. Um, 
because uh, we know that there are other statements about the soft limits of amplitude. They're not associated with sort of universal poles the way we think about the Weinberg uh, soft theorem, um, but there are facts about, the, uh, about soft amplitudes. Um, so, so more facts about soft amplitudes um, are that we have the 70 scalars in uh, n equals a, um, and uh, and first of all, uh, so there's an SU8, uh, they're in the 70 of uh, the SU8 R symmetry. Um, and uh, first of all, we know that um, uh, we know that the amplitude for emitting any one of these uh, scalars xi, that, uh, that that this amplitude as the momentum for xi goes to zero goes to zero. So there's a there's an Adler zero. Okay. Now, uh, the average zero is usually thought of as quite a distinct thing from the, uh, from the Weinberg graviton soft theorem. And yet, these are two soft behaviors of particles in the same multiplet. Okay. And there, there's the scalars and the gravity multiplet. We only have the gravity multiplet in uh, n equals a. So as the momentum goes to zero, the, gravi the graviton does something universal. The gravitino does something universal. Captured, the graviton captured in a beautiful way on the celestial sphere. But it must be that all of these behaviors have a have a uh, have an appropriately supersymmetrized uh, um, uh, interpretation in terms of the uh, some appropriately supersymmetrized version of the of uh, uh, BMS. Uh, and it actually goes beyond this. And I think here is where it gets really interesting. So the sort of infinite aspect of BMS uh, we, we we understand is just interpreted uh, from the usual amplitudes. Uh, as the fact that we can emit any number of soft gravitons and they don't interfere with each other. Um, so that, uh, so that the, 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 uh, because, because gravitons are not interacting at low energy, so that, uh, so that uh, the amplitude for emitting any number of soft gravitons uh, is just, the, uh, is just uh, multiplying the uh, uh, Weinberg factor for each one of them. However, this stops being true when you talk about the emission of scalars. And when you talk about the emission of scalars, something uh, interesting happens, that if you emit two scalars, um, uh, so let's say scalar i and scalar j, then, uh, uh, then this amplitude uh, uh, has an interesting uh, zero over zero type of uh, singularity. This has been understood for over 10, 10 11 years now. Um, uh, so for every hard line i, um, if these have, uh, if the two scalars have momenta qi and qj, there is a singularity that is proportional to qi dot uh, the hard momentum divided by qj dot the hard momentum. Uh, and I sum over our, all the hard lines, this factor multiplied by a particular SU8 rotation um, uh, of the ordinary amplitude where you don't uh, attach any. So in other words, if we think about the uh, 70 scalars as, in the, as being in the 70 of, uh, of um, uh, SU8, uh, this is telling us uh, that the emission of two, uh, uh, of, two of these uh, uh, scalars is giving an SU8 rotation. And in fact, this is the amplitude avatar. Uh, this is the amplitude uh, avatar uh, of the E77 symmetry uh, of n equals a supergravity. In other words, uh, this is the amplitude way of seeing that, that, the, that the commutator of, uh, if you think about the x's, the 70 scalars as the, as the broken generators of, uh, of uh, E7 uh, down to um, uh, SU8, uh, then this fact about the amplitude is telling us that the commutator of two x's is a t, where t is inside uh, SU8. Okay, so, so you see there's something interesting here. Double graviton emission is uh, commutative, sort of abelian, um, but double scalar emission is not. And the non-commutation uh, is telling you something about the E77 symmetry. Again, these are all statements about the soft limit of amplitudes um, uh, for n equals a. Uh, and it would be wonderful if they're given a uniform symmetry understanding on the celestial sphere, appropriately uh, uh, supersymmetrizing <coughs> uh, the, the bosonic story for BMS. 
All right, that's the first first comment. Uh, any questions about that? All right. Okay. Okay. So, um, a uh, um, Indy has a question. Yes, sir. Can you see this already in n equals four? Is there a similar structure, Yang Mills? Uh, there is. Um, uh, I I forget what the I forget uh, I forget what the uh, what the analog of the of the e seven seven is. But you're right. We don't have to go all the way up to n equals eight. I just uh, expect that it's uh, as nice as possible. In uh, I mean, usually in amplitudes, going to more supersymmetry makes life easier and not harder. <laughs> so so one one, one would recently yeah. recently the n equals four the celestial stuff has been worked out i don't think n equals eight has yet but maybe it's already in there anyway okay, yeah, a, perhaps yeah, yeah. i, I the, 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 there's certain i mean certainly the analog of the adler zero is there and i forget what the analog of the e77 is but it's something smaller than the e7 but it's it's not non-empty I, I forget what it is but uh, uh but there, there was something there um and uh, I should also say that 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 uh, just as a technical point, uh, a crucial part of seeing a lot of this uh, uh, Suzy stuff is is using these uh, Grassmann coherent states. Um, uh, uh, it, it, it is dealing with uh, it is is working with um, uh, Grassmann coherent states that are that are a, a linear combination of the uh, of the of the graviton and eta the the gravitino and then plus dot dot. The plus helicity graviton and some eta to the eighth, the minus helicity graviton, um, and uh, uh, this is a way of talking about things which makes the full SU eight R symmetry manifest, um, but is not chiral, but 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 is very chiral, um, and we were just talking, uh, we were just talking uh, 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 in the last break about the, a recent paper of uh, Brenhuber and uh, Kravaglini et al. That does the analog of this uh, chiral um, on-shell superspace for celestial amplitudes. It, it seems to me that it might be more natural to do something that's sort of half um, that, uh, that that would uh, that would see only the uh, SU4 cross SU4 uh, subset of the R symmetry, but treat the lambdas and the lambda tildes on a more equal footing. Uh, given the normal celestial sphere, we do uh, treat the lambdas and lambda tildes basically on an on an uh, on an equal footing. Uh, with, with a Z and a Z bar, that maybe it would be most natural to deal with this more parabetometric uh, form of the, uh, of the uh, superspace. It, it should be very easy uh, to do, but anyway, that's just a small uh, technical problem. So, so by the way, there's another question by Praha. Um, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to uh, comment. Uh, uh, so to, in order to see the E77 structure using soft scalar theorems, we'd have to understand simultaneous soft limits. Right. Yeah. Where the two energies of those two scalars are equal, and then you take the simultaneous limit. And I don't know if there's any symmetry interpretation, known symmetry interpretation of that yet. Well, right, but but uh, but I'm saying that the that the that uh, for for simultaneous soft graviton emission, this is the infinite nature of BMS. Is exactly the fact that we can emit any number of soft gravitons. So uh, so that's why I'm 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 that that's that that's why this might have some teeth because uh, we'd be putting all these facts on, uh, on, a, on a more equal footing on the celestial sphere, hopefully. Um, yes. So there's some sort of abelian part. Uh, I don't know what you call it. I'm not, maybe I'm not saying the, the, exactly the correct technical word, but there's the fact that you can emit any number that you can put any number of soft gravitons uh, um, in, the, in the vacuum, which we already understand in, uh, in the BMS, but then there, there should be some sort of the scalar partner of that that's more, Non abelian and pulls this E77 structure out. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. So let me, um, uh, okay. So uh, I already took up a lot of time with that. Sorry about that. Let me, um, uh, oops, that's a different screen. That, that, that's fine. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so let me now just make, um, uh, then let, let me switch to uh, uh, talking about. Actually, maybe uh, uh, one more basic point. Uh, this has already been uh, brought up, but just just to say um, another uh, question, which we might learn something from just exploring more and transforming back and forth between uh, known amplitudes, is um, what is causality uh, for celestial amplitudes? 
And here, uh, at, in the, at the most basic level, if we imagine, um, uh, if we imagine uh, the uh, 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 the two to two scattering amplitudes um, as the Mellon transform uh, of the of the uh, Of the ordinary um, amplitude was, uh, as a function of uh, uh, two to two amplitudes as a function of center of mass energy. Um, we know a lot of things. Uh, we know some things about the analytic structure of, uh, of, of, of m of beta and z. Um, but, uh, but here's a totally trivial thing. So, so um, uh, we can take m of beta and z. Um, starting in uh, Mellon space, and we can shift it uh, by m of beta and z um, plus <coughs> um, some mu to the beta. Okay, so just something very, very simple uh, like that. Now um, we know enough about this uh, m of beta and z to know that uh, there is some universal behavior as mu to the beta as we go off to a large negative beta. Um, uh, there is some behavior that goes like m star to the beta, where m star is the gap to the lightest uh, sort of heavy state in the theory. Uh, and furthermore, in a theory of gravity, out in this direction, uh, m actually behaves even faster than, uh, uh, grows even uh, faster than exponentially in beta. So if we add this mu to the beta, uh, we're not adding any singularities, we're not adding any poles, and if we make mu larger than um, uh, m star, I guess there's a minus beta here, but anyway, if we make uh, mu larger than uh, m star, it's also subdominant. Uh, th th so th this correction is uh, uh, subdominant both uh, for, um, for large positive beta and for large negative beta. So uh, apparently this is an innocent move. It doesn't affect singularities, poles, nothing. Um, it's subdominant uh, uh, at infinity, uh, but it shifts the amplitude back in momentum space um, uh, to by something which is horribly non-analytic. So plus a delta of omega minus mu. Okay, that's a horribly non-analytic um, uh, uh, thing. And so there are some very basic requirements that we, that we still don't understand on the amplitudes in Mellon space um, in order for them to be compatible with even the most basic version of uh, analyticity for the amplitudes back in uh, momentum space. So it would be really nice to get a better handle on what would rule out that stupid possibility um, and what further properties the amplitude needs to have in, uh, uh, in the Mellon space in order for its transform to even be analytic Never mind the the like the detail things that we already know about uh, two to two to the two amplitude. All right. Um, okay. So let me make um, uh, two more comments, uh, and then I'll then I'll then I'll end. Um, now about uh, uh, I think the sort of the bigger bigger question of uh, of the question to which uh, 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 the amplitudes are the answer, um, and how thinking about celestial amplitudes could help with that. Now, one thing which has always bugged me um, uh, in thinking about ordinary momentum, there, there are two things, two sort of big things that have bothered me a lot about thinking about ordinary momentum space uh, amplitude. Um, and let me maybe mention the most fundamental one uh, first. So imagine you are looking for some whiz bang theory of the uh, S matrix. And so you really imagine there's some simple theory, some simple principle, something, um, that's going to give you an ab initio uh, understanding uh, for what those objects are. Well, if we have gravity, there is one region where we really expect um, uh, uh, some, some interesting both qualitative behavior um, as well as sort of sharp uh, quantitative things uh, that, uh, that, that, that a theory of, uh, uh, of quantum gravity and of the, uh, the S matrix in particular should give us. And, uh, and that's what happens to uh, um, uh, high energy fixed angle uh, amplitudes, okay? Uh, and 
The reason is that for energies that are parametrically above M Planck, well, we have some expectation of what happens in, uh, uh, in the theory of gravity. Um, uh, we're supposed to make black holes and the black holes are supposed to Hawking evaporate. Uh, so uh, unlike you know, the conventional thing, uh, field theories like the weak interactions or other non-renormalizable field theories where you have no idea ahead of time what happens when you scatter particles at energies a thousand times the mass of the W, for example, before we knew about uh, what UV completed the, the uh, uh, weak interactions. Um, uh, in gravity, we know something, at least qualitatively, we know something ahead of time about what happens when we scatter things at incredibly high energies to make black holes, um, uh, and they are Hawking evaporate. Um, and that tells us, um, uh, that uh, tells us uh, something um, about what to expect for the, oops, uh, sorry guys, uh, my, my laptop here is just choking. Um, well, okay, let me just switch to let me just switch to a talking. Can 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 you still see me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, okay. So uh, now the two to two amplitudes at high energies um, are expected to be uh, are are expected to be exponentially soft. Again, from this uh, from this blackaholic picture. Um, you expect the two to two amplitude to go like e to the minus the entropy of the black hole, um, whose mass is given by the center of mass energy of the collision, roughly. Um, but there's a there's a simple picture for what's going on. Oh, it seems to have uh, uh, recovered. So let me see. There, there, there's a simple picture for what is going on, and, and I should stress there, there's no proof of this, but it seems like a fairly simple picture. That uh, so so the the expectation. Um, is that the, the amplitude uh, uh, for two to two scattering uh, and energy is way bigger than M Planck goes like e to the minus energy squared over M Planck squared. This is in, in four dimensions, maybe with some number there. Okay. And this is again, reflecting the fact that really you're making uh, a black hole, uh, but the amplitude for the black hole to decay back into two particles is, uh, is exponentially small. It's given by e to the minus the, the entropy of the uh, black hole. But you should not think that that means that, that there is some sort of simple amplitude, you know, amplitude is a function of energy uh, that you know, does like whatever it does down here at low energies, but then above M Planck, it just is smoothly dying off exponentially in this way. Um, it seems much more likely that what it's doing is something sort of, uh, is something chaotic. Okay, so that uh, <clears throat> it's, it's controlled by this envelope, but that it's actually varying in some interesting uh, chaotic way. Um, this is a sort of a feature of, a, of, a, of chaos that's sort of seen uh, over and over again in discussions of uh, black holes. I'll give you a very simple toy model that would tell you where this could come from, um, which is that uh, if you imagine you have some in-state and, uh, and some out state, uh, and, um, uh, and imagine that, that uh, here we're talking about an, an amplitude for creating the sort of ith black hole then many of the gross features of black hole physics are captured just by assuming that this vertex is of order e to the minus the entropy of the black hole over two times some random phase, okay? Uh, which depends on whether it's, uh, which depends on the, uh, whether it's in, in, in or out. Now, why does this model work? Well, first of all, it uh, tells you that the total cross section is the sum over all i, the, 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 the total cross section for making a black hole is the sum over all i of this thing mod squared, which is e to the minus s over two squared multiplied by e to the s, which is the number of black hole states, which is of order one. So that's correct. The cross section for making a black hole is of order one at high energy. In fact, it grows at the power with energy, but I'm not keeping track of any of the power dependence here. I'm only keeping track of the exponential dependencies. But the same logic would tell you that the amplitude for two to two scattering is now exchanging uh, the uh, black hole states like this. So I would get a sum over I and e to the minus S over two from each end. So that gives me an e to the minus S, but then I'd get an e to the I, the phi of in minus phi of out, which depends on the black hole state I. And so here's the uh, crucial thing is that now I have effectively some random phase, which I'm averaging when I sum over all the black hole states. And so, uh, so this becomes uh, e to the minus s uh, times 
an average of uh, e to the s random phases, which would give me an e to the plus s over two, the so usual root n uh, 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 cancellation. So this for the amplitude would give me something that looks like uh, that, that that looks like e to the minus uh, s over two. Okay, um, but uh, that's roughly what it is in magnitude, but it's coming from averaging all these random phases. So you expect that if you looked at the actual function, it would not look like something smooth like this, but it would reflect these sort of wild uh, oscillations coming from averaging all these phases. So that makes it seem pretty hopeless if we're trying to like, you know, look ahead to what the whiz bang spectacular theory of the S matrix might look like. It makes it seem a little bit hopeless that the, that, that the function that this thing is supposed to spit out, out at very large um, uh, energy, especially this is somewhere where, where we, we should really be able to see something universal about this uh, black hole physics, um, uh, is something very, very wildly, chaotically uh, uh, oscillating. However, this is not what we expect when we have uh, celestial amplitudes. And, and, uh, and the reason is exactly that the celestial amplitudes are are scattering boost eigenstates. Because they're scattering boost eigenstates, we're not actually, uh, so, so first one qualitative uh, feature of that is that instead of the amplitude dying as you go to large energy, um, uh, uh, in, uh, when you do the Mellon transform, that means that they grow exponentially with beta at large positive beta. That's already kind of nice that, that, this, that, that you, you're looking for a big feature of the amplitude, that it's getting bigger and bigger as you go to large beta. And that exponential growth or even factorial growth with large beta as the Mellon uh, celestial avatar of the exponential decay of the two to two uh, uh, amplitude um, that we expect in gravity. But secondly, uh, these oscillations go away. That's because we're averaging over energy. Okay? Um, so, you know, when, when, when people in other contexts, especially in the past few years, have been talking about averaging uh, and different ways of averaging over theories, maybe the wormholes have to do with averaging over theories, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's always some kind of open issue. What you're supposed to average, how you're supposed to average, what question, what average question you're, you're supposed to ask. I find it interesting that when we scatter boost eigenstates, we have an automatically average question. Uh, and so we're gonna get some answer uh, from the transform. If we had, if we had the, the, the full theory, we will get an interesting smooth function um, uh, for this, uh, for this uh, transform. Now, obviously, uh, uh, if you have two different theories um, and uh, their average uh, exponential envelope will look the same, but the details of the oscillations will look different, that will clearly be reflected in the Mellon amplitude too. They will look different, but they will look smooth. And that looks like something uh, uh, that looks like something very interesting and uh, important to me. It makes it seem more plausible that there's a theory for the celestial amplitude than that there's a theory directly for the uh, for the momentum space uh, uh, amplitude. So the, the sort of averaging that goes into defining the boost eigenstates is uh, is 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 helpful here uh, for giving us a better a better controlled, less wildly oscillating, more interesting. Uh, maybe easier to uh, control large beta uh, behavior. Um, okay, so now, now there isn't much to do with, uh, but th there is something to do along uh, these lines, um, uh, which is uh, which is the uh, following, um, and this is a very annoying feature of. Uh, it's a very annoying feature. Uh, well, so the, of, it's very annoying that we don't know the answer to this question even in momentum space. So there's really something to understand even in uh, momentum. Uh, I've advertised um, already that uh, we expect that the that the uh, that the two to two amplitude at large uh, fixed angle, uh, so theta of order one, that this is something very hard to calculate, and it goes like e to the minus uh, uh, the entropy of the black hole, some constant, or e to the minus some constant energy squared over m Planck squared. Okay. Now, what we really expect is that. Um, this should look like e to the minus energy squared over m Planck squared times some function of the angle theta. And remember, I, I emphasize this is fixed high energy scattering, fixed angle high energy scattering. But we expect that this f of theta um, should actually go to zero in the forward limit 
Now, this is no, this is not the regi limit. This is still not the regi limit because the uh, the uh, the regi limit is really keeping t fixed once and for all and sending f to infinity. Okay, but if but this is a limit that's that's as close as you can get to the uh, to the to the regi limit. Okay, and um and because we expect that in the regi limit we lose this exponential depression, um uh. Uh, and, and instead, we get a, a, a power law bound on the growth of the um, of the amplitude with s. Um, that's one out of many arguments that 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 tells you that that we expect that f of theta goes goes to zero. Now, in fact, in the old work of Ciappelloni, Amati, and uh, Veneziano, um, they say something about this behavior at very at very high energy. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, there's a uh, th there's a there's there's an approach to high energy scattering, um, which begins just by summing these uh, iconal diagrams. Okay, um, so this just gives you elastic scattering, um, and therefore just uh, just the the amplitude goes like has a real, I mean it, it's it's a phase. So it's just elastic scattering. So it's e to the minus some uh, uh, time delay delta as a function of e. Um, uh, uh, and and this is basically e to the i, uh, the energy times the uh, times the gravitational radius, okay, with some some number out in front. Uh, but it's obvious that there is an onset to this behavior with um, uh, black hole production that they started looking at by looking at these diagrams. So this is called the H diagram, and clearly the imaginary part of this diagram uh, involves gravitational radiation. Okay, and so that gives an imaginary part um, to the that gives an imaginary part to this uh, uh, to this effective iconal phase, and that imaginary part is what starts making the amplitude decrease exponentially rather than just uh, uh, oscillate. Okay, um, but you would, you would expect that in the limit as the theta goes to zero, that the physics is dominated by gravitational radiation, and so at least as theta goes to zero, this should be calculable. Okay, so 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 uh, so uh, Amati Veneziano, uh, uh, Amati Ciappelloni Veneziano sort of estimated it by looking at this one diagram, but this looks like classical physics. It looks like there's some sort of classical physics of of high energy super Planckian um, uh, gravitational radiation, which should allow us to calculate this function f of theta. As theta goes to zero, and in fact, maybe the most uh, maybe we expect that f of theta is just some constant times theta squared plus dot 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 as theta goes to zero. So maybe it's even just about computing that constant. I don't know, but it has some behavior as theta goes to zero. We should be able to calculate it as theta goes to zero. And I should also say that people doing uh, simulations of um, uh, colliding gravitational waves. Um, uh, sorry, uh, 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 colliding shock waves to produce black holes. I've noticed that something like 16% of the energy in the initial state is radiated into gravitational radiation. So, uh, so there's a big part of the high energy collision is just the huge burst of gravitational radiation, um, and that's something that sounds like it should be accessible. It should be. We should be able to uh, compute it. If we could compute it, then that would give us one piece of data. Uh, for when we really know the high energy amplitude, we can do the calculation and we can at least see as theta goes to zero, uh, what the sort of universal behavior that we could expect is in, uh, in the quantum gravity. And that would be, a, 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 that then if we knew that, either in momentum space and Mellon space or wherever we know it, that would at least be a very important piece of data. Uh, and we could uh, uh, try to see if we can now extrapolate away from there uh, towards the fixed angle regime where uh, where it's really blackaholic physics. And as I said, in momentum space, we expect some chaotically oscillating uh, amplitudes. Um, uh, in Mellon space, they should be smoothed out. Okay, the, the, the final comment I'll make about the physics of uh, UV completion is another thing that's uh, always annoyed me about uh, thinking about uh, scattering amplitudes in um, UV complete theories is that let's say take uh, string theory as an example, or it doesn't even matter. I mean, take uh, or, or the W, Zs and Higgs um, for the uh, UV completion, so the UV completing gravity for UV completing the weak interactions. Uh, 
Um, uh, okay, in all of these cases, we have some uh, unstable particles are crucial to the physics. Okay, obviously the W and the Z and the Higgs are all, they're not, they're, they're narrow resonances. So they're definitely particle-like, uh, they're, um, they're, uh, but they're not stable states. They're not officially there as asymptotic states in the scattering function. And uh, it's even worse in string theory where we have this infinite power of states, almost all of which are unstable with very rare exceptions the, the, there, there are some uh, massive stable uh, string states, but typically all these uh, these infinitely many higher uh, spin uh, uh, string excitations are all unstable. Um, and at tree level, it's crucial to think about them all as particles. They all participate in scattering processes. Uh, you know, in the case of the weak interactions, the entire story of the need for the Higgs is unitarizing WW scattering. Uh, in string theory, we famously get a consistent uh, set of interactions for these massive higher spin uh, particles. So obviously their existence is absolutely crucial to thinking about the physics of UV completion. But on the other hand, they're not officially there as scattering states. Okay? Uh, and if we're thinking about the exact theory of the S matrix, it's very, um, it's very annoying not to have uh, some of the most important objects that are relevant for the physics sort of there as part of, as, as part of the things that uh, uh, that you're writing down formulas for. Now, it's worth contrasting this with what happens in anti de Sitter space. So when you think about the uh, uh, anti de Sitter space, we know that if we have some massive particle in the bulk, it corresponds to some uh, uh, operator of large dimension uh, on the boundary. Um, but then you say, okay, good. What happens if that particle is unstable? So in the bulk, it decays, okay? Um, uh, well, in ADS, that does not mean that the operator disappears. <laughs> um, uh, and that's because ADS is a box. When the massive particle decays in the bulk, um, its decay products don't go off to infinity. They get trapped in the box. And it's sort of meaningful to talk about, a, uh, if you like, uh, the, uh, a, a mixed state, um, which, is, uh, which is a combination of the massive particle and all of its, uh, and all of its decay products. Um, uh, together, okay. So they're all sort of in 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 this in this box. In the CFT side, that's just operator mixing. So we, we might have some single trace operator and multi trace operators um, corresponding to the particle and its decay products, and they can mix uh, with uh, each other. So they don't go away. They're all sitting there. In other words, the the multi particle potential final state is sitting there. The single particle state is sitting there as another operator, and then they, they mix with each other. But we don't all of a sudden just lose them as soon as they decay. Whereas in the conventional way of thinking about the S matrix, we just lose the particle. OK, sure, you can analytically continue and see them underneath the branch cuts. Um, but that's, uh, that's an awfully difficult way to have access to, to the things that are such an important part of the uh, physics. Now, I think this is something I've mentioned this a few times before. I should try to do something about it myself, but in the in the uh, in the spirit of the discussion, I just want to say it again. It seems plausible to me that uh, that the scattering amplitudes for unstable particles make a lot more sense on the celestial sphere than they do for momentum amplitudes. Okay, and and it's again because we're talking about scattering boost eigenstates. Okay, um, why can't I do the same thing we do in ADS? In, uh, in, in flat space. Why can't I say that I'm going to uh, collide not a muon, which decays, but a linear combination of a muon and its decay products, an electron and a muon neutrino and, and an anti uh, uh, electron neutrino? Why can't I do that? Well, I can, I can certainly do that. I can say here's a muon, here it's the uh, uh, decay products and scatter it against something else. But it's obviously physically stupid because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's decay products are going in every which possible direction and they don't participate in the scattering process that I actually care about. However, uh, if, I'm, if I'm colliding a boost eigenstate of a muon, uh, the vast majority of the states in that boost eigenstate have the muon you know, incredibly boosted and all the decay products are moving in the same direction as the muon. So it's intelligent to label the state, which is just a new one, and its decay products collectively by one point ZZ bar on the celestial sphere where the infinitely boosted version of all of these guys go. Or said another way, 
in, uh, for most of that boosting, we have a bigger and bigger time dilation for the decay. And so we really have the states sitting there. They haven't decayed. We collide them. They're actually hitting each other. They have not uh, decayed. So that seems to be a physical reason why it makes uh, more sense to talk about the scattering amplitudes of unstable pro uh, particles on the celestial sphere than it does uh, for ordinary momentum eigenstates. And that's something that could be uh, explored. I think it's uh, very simply explored in toy models. And if it's true, it would be really fascinating to go back to examples in string theory or even the W and the V and the Higgs and see uh, um, uh, how we can bring back the unstable particles to having a kind of equal footing to uh, a more equal footing to the stable ones in the description of the physics. And I should say this last point is also related to something very basic that still needs to be better understood on the celestial sphere, which is the physics of collinear singularity. Famously, soft singularities are turned into beautiful symmetry statements on the celestial sphere. Collinear singularities are still not uh, uh, well understood, but um, there is this sort of sense that, uh, that uh, for the same reason that, uh, that on the celestial sphere, having a particle and all the guys that it's collinear with that it can slip to, they all end up on the same DZ bar that that should give us uh, that 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 should give us uh, uh, a, a, a better physical way of uh, of thinking about collinear splitting and this issue of unstable particles is very closely related to that. Okay, so I think uh, it's the same the same basic intuition that that life should be better when you talk about the uh, uh, boost eigenstates would would tell you not only that dealing with uh, collinear divergences is in better shape, but that dealing with unstable particles. Uh, is also in, in, in better shape, and there should be a well-defined notion of, uh, of, a, of a boost eigenstate scattering for unstable particles. Um, okay, that's all I want to say. Sorry, I went on for uh, so long. No problem. Thanks a lot, Nima, for, for your um, raising all these points. Uh, um, so I open now the panel uh, for uh, questions to um, Sebastian and Nima, uh, but also um, you can ask uh, questions to the other speakers of the day, like Lionel um, Henriette, if she's around, and, and Tim and Ashkay. Okay, so please, please go ahead. Uh, I see a question by Mark. Oh, hi, uh, Nima, I just wanted to comment briefly. Uh, when you were talking about the E77 of N equals eight, and Andy Strominger asked what the analogous story for n equals four is. Oh, you're muted. You are muted now, Nima. But yeah, do, do you know what it is for n equals four? Well, but but it's very different there, right? Because you only have a massless S matrix at the origin of moduli space. So you don't even have even the single soft limit of a scalar. Sorry, doesn't uh, 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 Mark, I, I assume that, oh, sorry. Oh. I assume that Andy meant n equals four supergravity, not n equals four super young. Oh, young. yeah. Oh, sorry, okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 if that's I, what he I meant, okay, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. That's, that, that, that's then then the question makes sense. Oh, so. uh, sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. For n equals four super young nodes, I, I totally agree. And for n equals four super young nodes, it might be nice to understand, you know, dual conformal invariance or something like that. But uh, but that's uh, but I think that's that's more far afield from soft theorem. I, I brought up the E77 because it really seems closely related to soft. It is a soft amplitude statement, so that it might have some nice uh, avatar. I just don't remember what the I don't remember what E77 goes down to when you decrease the uh, the amount of uh, uh, Susie. That's all. Right, when it's n equals four, it's just SU11. Uh, and, and n equals four supergravity is just SU11. Yeah, yeah. I mean um, that's uh, yeah. More questions or comments to the speakers? Tom? Uh, that's a question. I don't know if Song He is around. Uh, if not, that would be a question for Sebastian. <laughs> um, Song, uh, I check. Um, because he gave it the scattering equations. Yeah, it's probably late for Song. In China, I think Song isn't around. Yeah, okay, so that's for Sebastian. <laughs> so, the uh, Song was, uh, was talking about scattering equations, and uh, so essentially evaluated certain uh, uh, 
object uh, on the solution of scattering equations, yes, which fixed the uh, z's, which and which uh, which fixed uh, when well, you solve scattering equations and that fixes this uh, positions uh, z's, yes, the coordinates. Now, for uh, uh, he and the answering question of Stefan, he said that the z's can be related to uh, the essentially of uh, this equation. The content of this equation is some way momentum conservation. Yes, I mean at, at least when you go to an MHV case. Mm -hmm. The scattering equation is essentially equivalent to, mo to the uh, momentum conservation equation. This is, this, this is, I understand it. Okay. I mean, the Z's uh, on the yeah. celestial spheres, uh, which, which you can express. Which are, as these are celestial momentum, spheres are. They solve the uh, scattering equations. Yes, so that's what I'm imagining. So the question, my question is whether you can think. Uh, the, so you evaluate a certain quantity to get scattering amplitudes, yes? Now, what is yeah. the, uh, to, uh, is the, the so-called, the object on which you are integrating, uh, of, which you are using the scattering equation, there is some, there is a quantity which you, to, you plug in the solutions of the scattering equation to something, okay? My question is whether you can interpret that object as a, uh, some type of off-shell extension of scattering amplitudes or uh, to configuration that may be not uh, uh, momentum conserving or off-shell. So just um, evaluating it on the, on the single solution, you mean? Or? No, no, exactly. So you have this object by itself and yeah. you, you evaluate it on the solution, but you, you look at the object itself. So the, the, the statement is that the CHY integrand if you evaluate yes. it with um, MHV kinematics, it only has support on this one solution. If you evaluate it on the any other um, types of polarization vectors um, and yes. MHV one, it just has, it has it gives you zero on the solution. Oh, okay. So away yeah. from the solution from the delta function, it 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 just has no no support. So th this okay, this so uh, you can appear to I see. Yeah. yeah well, my question is sort of obvious that whether you can use scattering equation to get some formation to get some extension of amplitudes of shell or to I would, I would say I would say no. Um, I would say no because um well for example in the, the twister string formalism the moment of conservation is sort of implied by parts of the um the rational curve constraints. In the in the CHY uh, formalism, the scattering equations are only well defined. There would not be a to c covariant unless you're on the support of momentum conservation. Oh, okay. So you have no SL two c under uh, unless you are on the on, on the solution. Okay. Yeah. All right. That that is good. Okay, I understand. Thanks. So the delta function which you have in the integrand always puts you on this, and then. Um, it, um, so, if, so again, for the for the rational maps, the twister maps, it it contains the delta functions already. Mm -hmm. As you can see by counting the number of integrations versus number of delta functions, you would have four left over, and this imposes the momentum conservation. The the scattering equations do not impose momentum conservation, but the scattering equations themselves are only well defined on the support of momentum mm -hmm. conservation. Okay, thanks. Um, so we have more questions. Um, That, does anyone maybe want to comment on the question um, as to can we formulate a theory on the scribe plus directly as opposed to on a single sphere? Is there any progress in that? Or? I was thought of trying to do that using some kind of 4D churn Simon's uh, analog, but I asked Costello about it and he quickly shut me down. <laughs> but I don't, because the scribe plus is like a bundle rather than a 
just a space. So it's very complicated how to, I mean, the U direction is sort of uh, bundled in a non-trivial way over the celestial sphere. So it's somewhat complicated what a natural action or even a natural kinetic term would look like. Like you could try to write, uh, but haven't uh, the, the theories for the soft sectors, at least that some Magne and other people have been writing, maybe they can be written on Scriplus. And maybe the theories that Chung and some people from 2017 or 18 had in their papers were some 3D churn Simons models on Scribe plus that <laughs> then reduces some 2D WZW models on the celestial sphere. But that was a bit, uh, yeah, I don't think that was very concrete, but it was still a proposal of some sort. I don't know if that went I anywhere. Say, I mean, I would, I would say that the Twister models are essentially, um, you, you know, the Twister space fibers over Scry, so there is an extra degree of freedom in there. Uh, but, but, but certainly the kind of turn Simon's actions and Twister actions could be regarded as a formulation out of Scry. Well, uh, the, sorry, the fully interacting Twister actions have got these non-local terms, which would, so yeah. you would regard the bulk as a bulk contribution. So that, that wouldn't be so good. But I guess the Sigma models uh, in Scry or in the Twister space then maybe have effective actions. But I guess the point is that they're, uh, when you look at the effective action, they have some sort of instanton type terms, which, uh, which then play the role of bulk contributions. Yeah, so as Lionel explained in the morning, if you were there in his talk, uh, Twister space can be thought of as some kind of a desingularization or whatever of Scriplus. So you go from the U coordinate to the mu alpha dot coordinate. What's the correct word for that, Lionel? I don't really know. Blow up or something? Well, no, it's just a Legendre transform, essentially. I mean, you, you, you know, it's right. a, uh, um, I mean, you're looking so, at an physics in Scribe. And so it's yeah. a Hamiltonian uh, Legendre transform for, for the ones that are in the sort of z tilde, you know, the z, sorry, the z equals constant plane. Yeah. Uh, so the in, so it's, uh, yeah, exactly. So because of that, it turns out that writing these twister action kind of things. So theories on twister space seem to be much well behaved than theories on scribe plus. So you can obtain uh, scribe plus by this projection from twister coordinates to scribe plus coordinates by taking u equals mu alpha dot lambda bar alpha dot. So that's a projection from twister space to scribe plus. But uh, in that sense, twister space is somewhat of a blow up of scribe plus, which sort of, it sort of desingularizes the u coordinate. So it, and then there are these actions on twister space, which are weak, weak, dual. So there's an action on twister space that Lionel introduced in 2005, that is the effective action of twisted strings. And it's weak, weak, dual to, you can prove uh, by classical manipulations that it's weak, weak, dual to space-time Yang-Mills theory. And- Yes, uh, if you that, a strong, weak duality, then uh, th this isn't your answer. But uh, 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 maybe weak, weak gets you going at, to some level, I mean. But the point I'd usually make is that twister space and ambi-twister space, you know, they're space of things that are non-local in space-time that do make it all the way out to null infinity. So if you have a formulation in either of those spaces, then I, I guess you can think of it holographically. So for, for the for the GR twister action, mm -hmm. does it make sense to ask for the carrier derivative corrections? Um, the, the, Can we find out? Oh, I haven't thought about that. But you could, in principle, so higher derivative corrections would be higher spin terms, or just uh, just some r mu neuro sigma r mu neuro. Oh, that, 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 just translation of the higher, uh, you know, just the usual effective Lagrangian expression. Is there something like this for in twister space? Oh, uh, even translating the gr kinetic term was a pain. I don't really know. Lionel, do you know? Well, uh, are you so, so so the way they work is that they ha there's a local action on the actual twister space, which, as I say, could be thought of as being sitting out of infinity. Uh, and you might be able to simply formulate it on scry as well. You might be able to gauge fix it in such a way that you don't really need to think about the twister space. But the um, uh, uh, but, but 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 in order to get the full theory, you need to have these 
instant on corrections, which look like a bulk contribution. So the MHV generating function is is, is typically uh, that the mm. comes from bulk correction, and that needs a whole an integral over the whole cut of scry, or, or the integral over the moduli space of the cut of scry. You could ask a more basic question: Can you sort of append twister strings? to calculate uh, uh, amplitudes coming from these higher derivative correction terms. Just good old twisted strings. And I don't think anyone well, we, like we, we, we know that the higher derivative correction terms, of course, are sort of somehow part and parcel of the original twisted string, uh, in the sense that it, it, it was really more of a theory of gravity, gravity than, 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 than conventional gravity. So it's really only David's, you know, the Skinner, so to speak, uh, 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 twisted string that does honest uh, super gravity. So I think I think somehow all of these kind of CHY and twister string like formulations are, are probably capable of incorporating higher derivative terms. Um, Can we do that in CHY somewhere? Might be the easiest thing to try. Yeah, there's been some work on, on doing that. I mean, so Song Song has some nice papers on. Uh, uh, just, just well, the yeah. operators. But, but they're very much, you know, he had to spot something, uh, an inter a CHY integrand that would do something. Uh, mm. uh, I, I mean, I don't think there's any ontology for these things. I, I, I mean, it'd be nice to know where they should be coming from or something. I think it's, it'd be more came up with them just through sort of, you know, you know spotting some, something that you could do. And then, so do you think that the, um, the fact that um, the solutions of the scattering equations are exactly the um, the points on the celestial sphere for the MHV case that this is an accident, or or I, 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 I think of that as an accident, and I think uh, uh, my, my own feeling would be that even with conventional strings, in some sense, um, identifying the world sheet of the conventional string with the celestial. Oh, you mean the subtle point? Um, the subtle points. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a uh, uh, yeah, just the fact that it's, it's a higher degree map and it changes from uh, uh, MHV degree to MHV degree and so on. Uh, I, uh, makes me think of it more as a coincidence, and it has no higher dimensional analog ways. Uh, could we think about? Could we think of this in terms of the disconnected prescription, maybe? Where you just well, somehow glue uh, MHV and together. Yeah, uh, um, I mean, the disconnected description certainly makes more sense as, as a loop, as a theory that has conventional loops, as we understand it. Mm. I, I don't know that anybody knows how to do any twist to string computations at higher loop orders. Uh, maybe that's a bit unfair. I mean, there are some papers by Dunham, Goddard, and so on. I don't know if they really line up with conventional string, uh, to conventional field theory loop computations. Sebastian, did you suddenly get interested in celestial bootstrap or something? What was the what was your last slide like using? You had something about bootstrapping celestial. Well, oh, really, really, yeah. I mean, really much the, the, in the same spirit as to what Nima was discussing about high energy fixed angle scattering. It, it seems like that naturally lives on, you know, um, in, in the sense we know we, we know about this very robust uh, feature that the gra the gravitational theories are supposed to behave well in this limit, but we never were able to sort of uplift that to some uh, say constraints on the Wilson coefficients or anything like that. So there's a, I think there's a real chance that we can use that in the in the celestial holography setup for the same reasons as Nemo was uh, fleshing out, essentially. Yeah, and if only we could figure out what exactly. Um, uh, so I, I think the I think uh, thinking about uh, uh, plus amplitudes is sort of one and a half steps, and we need two. Um, but uh, uh, but we have. Um, uh, for ordinary momentum space scattering, we know what causality means very well, which is uh, which is the 
pretty well, not, but well, well enough practically um, uh, for many cases, not, not all cases, but for two to two scattering, at least, we know that we're supposed to impose, uh, we're supposed to impose uh, Reggie behavior at fixed T. And that allows us to write down dispersion relations. Um, even that we don't understand perfectly well, but you know, if we have a theory with a gap and if T is small compared to the gap, then we can write down, uh, then we can write down fixed T dispersion relations. And following from fixed T dispersion relations, we have all these constraints. Uh, uh, we, we, have a, we have a wealth of constraints on, on, on the amplitude. But as many people have observed, if you look at the, if you look at the sort of space that's allowed just by consistency with positivity, um, unitarity and, uh, and causality, um, then there is some sort of space of allowed uh, coefficients for higher dimension operators. And, what, and what's actually occupied is a much smaller region of that whole space. And if you go and ask um, what is missing, what's missing clearly is, uh, is the fact that, uh, that these amplitudes that we're constraining at fixed T continue at high energy and fixed angle to be something which doesn't grow and explode. Um, uh, and we have no idea how to input uh, that. We know that it has something to do with the fact that the higher spin contributions to the, uh, to the partial wave expansion die with spin. That's that these facts are clearly related to each other somehow. Whereas all causality tells you is that there is a dispersion relation and all unitarity tells you is that the fixed angle, co that, the, that the partial wave coefficients have to be positive. It doesn't tell you anything about the ordering that high spin should be smaller than low spins and so on. But observationally, the, um, the, the, the partial wave coefficients die off very quickly with spin in any healthy theory, be it field theory at loop level or string theory at tree level where people have examined it. And that clearly has something to do with the fixed angle uh, high energy limit of the amplitude. So that's why it's wonderful that celestial amplitudes force you to talk about things that have a well-defined behavior in that limit. But the thing that we still don't know how to do, which is why we're still stuck translating back and forth and not learning something essentially new yet, is we don't know exactly what causality means for the, uh, for the celestial amplitude. So that's, the, that's, what, that's what needs to be uh, completed in order to do significantly better. For momentum amplitudes, we know what causality means. Practically, we don't know what uh, high energy uh, softness means. We would like to know for celestial amplitudes, high energy softness is hardwired in. We need to know what uh, we need to know what uh, causality means, and then we'd be cooking with gas. It, it's sort of related to this question that um, a comment that we should be really distinguishing between in and out states, even though we identify them to live right. on, the, on the same on the same sphere. I was wondering in terms of um, so as far as I remember. Uh, uh, I understand from Tim's talk. I'm not sure if he's here. Um, we went to take care of his baby. The, yeah, yeah uh, uh, there there was no distinction between say positive helicity in state and negative helicity out state. Is that right? Yeah, actually, I, I see that uh, Eduardo is here, so maybe he. No, no, the. There is a distinction. We just uh, didn't well, put an extra label in. We just well, gave the same positive. How does it come about? So what happens is the most direct thing that these vertex operators of P compute are the collinear splitting functions. And in that case, everything, all the science and everything is built in. And then when you melon transform different cases just get to be handled differently, just like in the original way that you did that uh, Taylor and uh, the friends derived these OPEs from the collinear elements. So the, yeah, the easiest. <laughs> Yeah. May, may I add, uh, from this work which you mentioned on Monday, my talk on Monday, you see this absolutely, you need the separate operators from in and out. Okay, yes. otherwise, uh, otherwise you will not get uh, it's physics with the uh, pressing equations and everything that we know. So that's why I'm completely convinced that you have two separate, two separate class of operators in and out, even in celestial CFT. Right, right. Because they're two different states, right? That's the reason, basically. What you say? Because there are two different states, you just have to have two different operators. Yeah, well, so, I mean, yeah. In other yeah. words, uh, just so you see that OPs for the if I can take amplitude and yes, S channel, and the S channel, which is one, two, goes to three, four. 
And then I go through this, or what I call shadow detour. You find that at the end, uh, you get the crossing equations with OPEs that you need for each income. You have to uh, you have a, you have to distinguish in one channel, for example, in a two-dimensional U channel, two three. You have one winner now, and the two-dimensional S channel, like three four one two. You have for three four, you have two outgoing. Okay, right. so OPEs are there appear in a mysterious way. Uh, yeah, I, I absolutely, I absolutely agree. In the, in the shadow case, it, it's absolutely clear. Uh, the, most of the comments yeah, but, 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 but I don't know, you missed the, the point. At the end, we, we managed to uh, invert the shadow. So the, the last form of the composition is for the plane amplitude, which is called the single value amplitude. And it right. has these properties, which are, Exactly, we have to in and out. I mean, otherwise it won't go. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that, yeah. Um, Sebastian, I have a question to, to you. I mean, actually it's, um, it's uh, related to um, some question you asked me uh, some time ago about uh, this um, string uh, virtual positions on the celestial sphere. I mean, so with Tom, uh, we, we had this result that when you send all energies, I mean, this lambdas to infinite, that then um, the, the string amplitude, um, the vertex operator positions are tied to the celestial sphere. So there's the same points as for four particle scattering in your You uh, asked um, whether this also holds for higher points. Uh, um, of course, this would be quite nice because it would also give us some relation um, which is independent on, on MHV or, or non-MHV configuration. So do you have any obstruction why you think uh, maybe from, from this Aomoto um, Gelfand hypergeometric function uh, construction? Or do you have any obstruction why, why this should not be the case that you can also um, relate higher point string amplitudes to um, in this um, large lambda limit to uh, points on the celestial sphere. No, I, I don't think there's any. I don't think there's any abstraction. The one one of the re reason for this question is that mm -hmm. uh, again we want to understand the spinning to z or z bar or the the other points on the on the sphere as, as well. You might ask, for example, can we determine depending on which point in the kinematic space we are, like what the angles are and so on? Can we determine which saddle is dominant? Um, in mm. the first place, can we can we somehow guarantee also the fact that all of the cells are suppressed so that such that the um, the Medin uh, transform is, is well defined in this limit, um, uh, and also the the there's a there's a separate question if we do it in separate crossing channels do we get the same answer? Um, the, so you want to, 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 to know in which uh, region of the, yeah, of the configuration space, um, I mean, um, you can do this limit for higher points. Sorry, what, what's the... So, what's the so you want to, to know in which um, kinematic space uh, you can take this, 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 um, this lambda goes to, uh, or what... Um, so what what is different to um, to the four point case um, when you uh, oh, the, one, one, of course the one more... that, yeah what what's different the difference is that we have more saddles mm -hmm. um, yeah so the there should be some funny interplay between which you know maybe one saddle is always dominant maybe 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 they're both equal or um, I don't know and the, the the separate question is also do we see I think in your in your calculation you've seen seen this delta function. And I was wondering if that's a general, the delta uh, beta, I guess, the sum, sum mm -hmm. of. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was wondering if that's a general feature that you would see at any multiplicity. Can you can you say that, or is that something that only happens at four points? Is there any is there any delta reason of the sum of sum of lambdas? Whether you yeah. see it. But this, oh, yeah. this has so, nothing to do with string theory. This already the field theory result. The no, 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 no. And then field theory is always there because the consequence of conformal invariance for the for dimensional conformal invariance. 
Yeah, the, the question was that the yeah this procedure of extracting the field free limit just as a coefficient of this delta function is that a general statement? Or, yeah. We, we don't know. Oh, I mean, you get that we had the, the field theory limit is, uh, is tricky, yes, if you go with the celestial, that, you know, that you cannot alpha prime, there's no alpha prime. You, you, you go to... Um, you have to go, you go uh, to some In angle, the astral which, operation, you go uh, to infinite. Yeah. And then you 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 uh, re, you see this delta function, this delta. Yeah, delta. but is that, is, that a, is that a general multiplicity result or, or um, just for... Probably you have a product of, or you have more. I mean, uh, this is uh, Anastasia. I, I computed this higher point um, field theory amplitude. So um, you should. My, my question is specifically can we extract cleanly the coefficient of um, the field theory uh, limit or. or field you... limit is cleanly as coefficient of some delta function at arbitrary multiplicity or, uh, or, or not? Or is it something you're asking, from, from, you're asking from string theory, yes? Starting from yes. string, theory, yes? yes? So we have to, the question is whether there's a specific limit. What is the limit actually in which this delta, which you need and for which appears in field theory, you reproduce it in some limit of the, of, uh, from string theory, yes? So yeah, in general, it's not clear. And, and uh, we know that uh, for four points, how to get there, by choosing like a, a forward scattering or something that I remember, yes, when it is dominated by massless exchange. Okay. I mean, uh, higher point, you have uh, more cross ratios, probably. You yeah, have so you have to do some with... more sophisticated kinematic limits to. So all of them, maybe there are some universal, um, or maybe Anastasia, you, you have, you, when I mean, you had this higher point, um, I, I told you, I think, uh, in the, some of the previous talks, I don't quite understand when you say, you, there, everybody says those words, but I don't really understand it. So, um, yeah. So, can you maybe make it precise? Yes, we know that. I know. I know how to write celestial amplitudes. You know, just Mellin transform on MH3 amplitudes. They they look very complicated. On the other hand, as you know, I I kind of know scattering equations came from our connected prescription many, many years ago. And MHV, they, they lie on the line, so there's no equations to solve. So now you're saying somehow these are the same things. I, I don't know, what, what is the statement you're trying to make? So maybe Nima, I don't know, so. Sorry, I was just gonna make a, a separate comment, which is that what the, 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 the work transforming uh, yang Mills amplitudes, that's different because there the, the theory scale invariant. So this omega integral is something kind of trivial. There's a one delta of omega that comes out, in, uh, a delta of beta, I mean, that, that, that comes out, out in front of the whole thing. And that's just the overall uh, scale invariance. Uh, I think extracting, um, uh, extracting the field theory limit from string theory is a totally different, it seems like a totally different thing. I don't know canonically how to, how to interpret uh, that I mean, there's some formal sense in which the delta of beta is what you get from this infinite power of poles. Um, for example, at uh, at, at four points. Uh, but it, this is the sort of very fundamental non-commuting uh, feature of the limits of uh, scattering boost eigenstates. That there is no <laughs> sort of meaningful sense in which you can take uh, in which you can take the sort of uh, mass to infinity uh, heavy mass to infinity limit and recover a field theory. Um, uh, amplitude. I mean, it, it's just there that if, if I didn't give you the Mellon representation, but I just told you, you have the function m to the beta over sine pi beta. Um, that's what you get from the exchange of a massive particle. And there, there's no obvious limit as you send m to infinity where that recovers delta of beta. Um, uh, because uh, because so, this m is yeah. an m is an overall factor. Mass exactly, this comes out as an overall factor. Exactly. Yes, yes. <laughs> so in some formal sense, uh, what used to be a delta of beta, not analytic in beta, that's the crucial thing, not analytic, turns into an infinite series of poles. Um, so there's some formal sense if you look at the Mellon representation that you could say, ah, I should call that delta of beta as m goes to infinity. But if someone just handed you the answer, I think you'd have you would never think to do that, and they're fundamentally different. One of them is non-analytic, and the other one uh, uh, is uh, uh, has poles, but it is uh, uh, analytic. 
Um, so, uh, but but the, the the situation is a little different in healthy UV theory that are at least sort of scale invariant like Yang Mills. There, there is a delta of beta. There's a single delta of beta, and it's reasonable to sort of factor out out in front of uh, uh, everywhere. Um, but yeah, I, I don't I don't actually see uh, a meaningful sense in which we can get field theory limit out of stringy uh, out of out of the stringy uh, Mellon amplitude. And this feature that the m to the beta comes out, I'm sure, is true at, at any multiplicity. That that has nothing to do with the uh, yeah. That that's the the basic non non commuting feature of the uh, limit. So the beta goes to infinite limit um, makes more sense. I mean, which is uh, the high energy. I mean, the lambda goes to infinite limit. Yeah, but but I don't know any. I mean, just just take these these two examples. Take a five to the four theory versus a phi cube theory where you exchange a massive particle, right? So mm -hmm. in other words, take one amplitude is one and the other amplitude is m squared over s minus m squared. Um, in field theory, as I take m to infinity, those two things become equal to each other. Uh, in the celestial amplitude, they're just not in any sense equal in any limit. One of them is delta of beta. The other one is m to the beta over sine pi beta. So there, there's just no, there's no, uh, I, I don't see a limit where those two things become um, uh, become the same. You want to say that even as beta goes to infinity, this m to the beta, but I don't think it's true that as beta goes to infinity, m to the beta over sine pi beta in any sense becomes delta of beta. Um, yeah, so I think there's some formal sense as beta goes to zero that, uh, that uh, sorry, as, as m, well, there must be some formal sense in which uh, as, but, but take, the, trivial. Yeah. The, take the angle to zero, then you exchange is mass, then exchange you, you, you are sitting on a massless limit, and then you get this delta. Okay, you can go to if you consider oh, if you do that. Yeah, if you do that, that that's fine. But, that's but, how, but I mean, that's, that's, I, 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 yeah, but 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 uh, but if we're talking about the exchange of massive particles, uh, then oh, then yeah, um, yeah, then uh, yeah, then. Um, yeah, that, that, that's really the, the example I, I was talking about. Just exchange a massive, yeah, I'm just saying, sorry, this, this is, I'm sure everyone knows what I'm saying. It's just, just, I just want to make this a trivial, trivial point. Um, uh, you know, uh, that it, we have this versus this. So one amplitude is some m squared, some constant lambda m squared over s minus m squared versus lambda, okay? And I'm just saying that, that this thing goes to lambda m to the beta over sine pi beta. And this is lambda delta of beta. And, uh, and the, the, so here in field theory, as m goes to infinity, uh, these two amplitudes become the same. The left equals right. Here, it's just not true. Um, there's some formal sense in which it's true, uh, of course, because it was true up here. It was true before the uh, Mellon transform, but, um, but uh, they, yeah, they're just not, they're just fundamentally different. Yeah, but for, but for n equals four or for, anyway, but, but for, uh, uh, theory of dimension was talking about them, uh, it seems fine. Then, then we just pull off the delta of beta and then, uh, then everything is uh, okay. But I think that was not the question Nasir was asking. You're asking about the scattering equations, Nasir, right? I think so. She, yeah, I think she asked about, uh, yeah. Yeah, about these comments people make, how, you know, scattering equation sphere is the same as celestial sphere and blah, blah, blah. In, well, the, in, the, in the connected prescription, it, it is a covering, uh, one covers the other. I guess the question is about the physical string, the traditional string. Uh, okay, could you explain it precisely what's in connected prescription? Yeah, could, could you make it precise, Sebastian, you know, how you, you know, how, just take some amplitude and write it for me for scattering equation and for on celestial spheres. So on one hand from scattering equation, on the other hand from celestial sphere and show me how these are related. I, I am, I'm, everybody says it's the same, but could you? Well, I mean, in the twist of string, you, 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 I mean, you already did it back 15 years ago. Uh, yeah, yeah, but that, yeah, it's just a lambda sphere, is it? 
different. Yeah. Okay. So so now, what is the claim? So so so, so I guess the claim is that when you in four dimensions, uh, the, the the solutions to the scattering equation geometrically are related to to, to, to scry, which had you, you know you could use the chy formula, you could use the twister string formula, or you could use the four D ambi twister string. But my claim is in the relationship to scry uh, that the, the, the um, uh, chy kind of world sheet will relate to scry by the same map in all three cases, uh, whichever formula you use. I mean the scattering equations are still the same. It's the same Riemann sphere for the scattering equations and it maps to scry with the same multi-degree map, whichever for whichever theory you're using. For, you know, with the CHY or twist string or the other twist string. And it's degree K minus one at N to K MHV. I hope that, but, but but it's not true that individual solutions of the scattering equations nail you somewhere on the celestial sphere. For these guys, I think equations. only for the MHV case. Uh, only for the MHV case, right? Mm -hmm. Well, no, summing over individual <laughs> MHV sectors. Yeah, so, so so I guess I guess you're summing over different maps, and those maps um, will each have a different connection to the Riemann sphere, uh, to, to the connection between the CH1 sphere and and the celestial sphere. Yeah, the MHV degree is clear from the vertex operators themselves, right? The vertex, the twister eigenstates contain delta functions of lambda minus kappa, and lambda is just the world sheet, the world sheet coordinate sigma at MHV degree by GL two gauge fixing, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> You see, I don't know what I said, but what I'm saying is that the relation simply is a uh, that's not only is that because man the saddle point is a uh, scattering equation, yes. So, four point function is integral for instinctively, you have a four point function is some integral over x, which is x's position of the x is the position of the vertex operator, yes, the one which you're integrating over. And then when you go to uh, cross uh, to the uh, uh, to the uh, s goes to the, to the cross the limit, you go to the subtle point. You find that the position of this operator is uh, uh, the square root of s essentially. Yes. Okay. So it is uh, it is uh, 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 this. Uh, so the x over which you're entering now becomes uh, rated through kinematics to the point on a celestial sphere. I guess at four points, there's, a, there's only one solution. Four, 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 four points. I'm just saying because I asked a question to that already. Okay, so so this is where the where, where this relation is coming from, and 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 it's MHV as well. So so, so I guess it's yeah yeah yeah. Four, four, yeah. That's one one solution. Four, yes, yes. yes. Is that is my solution and so on and so on. Yes. But I guess when you're working in the true string, uh, uh, you, you presume you've got a whole family of maps from the world sheet to the um, celestial sphere. No, no, but in the there's, 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 a little bit of, there's a little bit of looseness of language here that I want to understand uh, properly. There's a there's an important distinction between the true string and the uh, and the twister string in the sense, just in the even at, at tree level in the in the dimensionality of the space that we're talking about. One of them is n minus three dimensional. The other one is two n minus four dimensional, and it has the extra information about the like. Well, I mean, it has exactly the same information as as the information in the lambdas and the lambda tildes, uh, as as just the lambdas. Let, 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 I mean, um, so uh, um, and in in particular, there's more information than just points on the celestial sphere. There's also the energies or the the the, the scalings of each one of those two dimensional vectors. So what exactly do you mean when you say that solutions 
uh, uh, of the of the of the scattering equations uh, pin you to the celestial sphere. I mean, there's also the scaling, the overall scaling in front. They 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 they, they pin you to the lambdas. For example, for M A three, they literally pin you to the lambdas. But there's more information on the lambdas than there are the uh, points on the celestial sphere. There's the there's the energies as well. Yeah, you have the lambdas in addition to the point. I mean, yeah, you have. You have the points yeah, on the so, celestial so really sphere. Not, I mean, now I, I'm just saying that the, that the when you have n points on the celestial sphere, it's n minus three dimensional space. The twister string is a two n minus four dimensional space. The the so uh, unlike the ordinary string, which is also n minus three dimensional. So um, so uh, I could I could imagine some kind of connection between a, a real world sheet, uh, uh, the actual string world sheet, and and the celestial sphere, but not the twister string, just because of these extra. The, these extra uh, variables. Practically speaking, it's the rescalings of each one of the two vectors. So it's not just the celestial sphere. There's certainly uh, some. Is that, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. There, there, there's some little group information there. There's a kind right, of. A, right. I mean, I mean, this is what I'd like to sort of refer to as a polarized version of the scattering equation. So you've got the extra information of the polarization data of each particle, and that sure. extends. That that's an extension, but. I, I guess what well, I would that, say that should somehow turn into dimension of operators. I mean, you know, it's the energy and energy space, and it should somehow turn into the it's dual to the dimension of operators under the celestial transform. But there's just more information. I'm I'm just saying the obvious thing. There's 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 more there there's this little group information on the twister string world sheet which is missing in the celestial on the celestial sphere. Well, I mean that that's more because you've got to map into the twister space as a whole, and um, uh, uh, well, so yeah, I, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so, so you remember sort of, more and the map between the uh, twister space or momentum space and the celestial sphere. We also have the extra information of the delta. So that's uh, so so yeah. That's right. But but under, just, I, 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 yeah. I mean, under, but, but, under seeing that map, there there, there is still a, 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 just a, just a map from sort of from one Riemann sphere to the other from the CHY Riemann sphere. Which, which, which is sitting underneath the twister string, you know, you could, uh, uh, it's just the abstract Riemann sphere uh, of, of the twister string. And then that maps to sure, the sure. celestial sphere. Uh, and, and yeah, that, 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 that's fine, of course, right. Yeah, so, so, so I guess the polarized scattering equations sort of models that um, Yvonne and I, and I guess David as well actually now, have been developing sort of do do some of that in higher dimensions, so you so, so you can see you can see the extra. So, so in four dimensions, this little group is just uh, one premise of a point, but of course in higher dimensions you get more. And um, uh, uh, yeah. But I guess I guess in the uh, true string, uh, that you, you know, it's no longer a discrete thing. So you you'll then have. Sort of in, integrals over that over some moduli space that maps from one sphere to the other. So, um, in the higher degree case, should we be thinking of building a celestial CFT on these branched covers rather than the celestial sphere? No. Okay. Someone was mentioning earlier, like uh, 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 talking about some kind of standard sound, sounding theory, turn Simon's theory, some some theory. I mean, just this question of the theory on the celestial sphere, and I'd just like to to ask. Um, I mean, already at four points, the most dramatic thing is that whatever this theory is should have the property that it gives you zero unless the correlation functions, unless the four points lie on a great circle, right? Unless they satisfy Z equals Z bar in order to uh, um, uh, uh, import momentum conservation, uh, in order to have uh, uh, momentum conservation. And of course, we, we, can, we can justify this and say it's natural that that, that sort of uh, discontinuous uh, 
uh, dependence on the amplitude is there because of their Poincaré blocks have infinitely many descendants, blah, blah, blah. That, that, that's, that's all fine. But if you have a theory, if you have a guess for a theory, the first dramatic thing that it should do is give you zero unless the four points lie in a great, great circle. So is there any uh, picture of a quote unquote theory, like, uh, like any kind of theory that would make that magic happen? So can we see that from the scattering equations? Can we see what from the scattering equations? This just thing is a bulk <laughs> side. Um, not not how we see it. Yeah. So that we can. Uh, the, 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 the scattering equations uh, uh, input, I mean, they have momentum conservation as an, as an input. Sorry, they so, do, right. Yeah. So, so it has to, be, has to be from the yeah. 4D ambitwister string or the twister string version, yeah. Uh, no, and the ambitwister string momentum conservation still comes through zero mode integral, right? In the path integral. So it can still be generated through the theory. It, it, it comes from from the delta functions in the vertex operators in the in the twister string and in the four D ambit twister string. So, no, in the usual ambit twister string, even where you get the usual scattering equation, the CH by scattering equation, the momentum conservation still comes from the zero mode integral of. The in that case, it's something from put in by hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but 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 it doesn't come from zero mode integrations. In four uh, D, no. No, but I was wondering, has the in the paper by Chung and other people that they had about these churn Simons theories and Spry and some 2D Vesemino written models on the celestial sphere? Did that did anyone follow that paper? Well, follow up with that models? Did it go anywhere? I don't know the paper, but uh, but uh, if they uh, that, that's why I was at, I mean, anything normal sounding on the celestial sphere is not going to do this magic. So I don't know what uh, I don't know what it what it could be. Um, uh, what, it can't be a normal kind of local standard theory on the celestial sphere because such a theory will not do this crazy thing of only giving you something non-zero when the four points lie on a great great circle. No, yeah, you're right, of course. Let me share the paper. So that, yeah. It's this paper. And they have some very initial like attempts at building models. But uh, section three, but yeah. But again, so, one of these things would probably be a strong weak duality. Yeah, sorry. So am I assuming correctly that these step functions would also come from zero mode integrations? In the, no, when I said zero, this was in the momentum eigens basis calculations. Yeah, presumably. I, I don't see immediately how that will happen, but. Those are your, your like ordering of the in out guy step functions, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, Z greater than one. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm guessing that, that I'm guessing that that that, that everything, all those non-analyticities come from, both of them come from the energy conservation part, which is the uh, yeah. So, but while yes. while the, the so while I, the great I, circle, I, I, I meant I meant the step function co probably comes from uh, extra constraint from energy conservation with positive energies. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. But so that's but that's the point. While the greater circle constraint goes away at five points, the the other constraints don't. So somehow right. they they're not. Uh... Sebastian, right. the yeah the theta functions will come from. This is exactly what happens in ADS as well. This is that's a d function thing, right? What's it? The, the analog of the momentum conserving delta function. So in my paper with Eduardo on these uh, celestial scattering equations, we have the analog. It's literally all the Mellon integrals can be taken inside uh, the formula past the scattering equations by converting the scattering equations into operator valued objects. And then you have some Mellon integrals acting on the momentum conserving delta function that turns into. Right. And in this case, all the, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I have some, that, okay. sorry, go ahead. 
I, I was just going to, just to clarify all, everything was commutative in this case, right? Or, or everything was commutative, yes. Okay, so, okay. Was the, Sorry. the operator was just e to the partial delta, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so the, the, the problem if you do everything in two two signatures, all of these step functions will turn into logs and so on, and uh, oh, yeah. um, and uh, and even I bet the I bet the uh, the delta z minus z bar has got to turn into actually. Do do what people know? I I uh, uh, if you look at the four point amplitudes in two two, do you get one over z minus z bar, or do you still get delta z minus uh, z bar? Why would you get... I guess you still get delta. Yeah, it's just momentum you still get delta. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. In the in the shadow basis, that uh, yeah, probably the shadow basis it would be one over z minus z bar. Yeah. No, no. It, so it, I, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. So okay. So then 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 I would guess that uh, then then I would guess that in in whatever in whatever the thing you do that gives you one over z minus z bar will turn into your theta into a log. Um, and uh, and maybe that's the sort of most analytic thing that we could we could try doing. Um, we kept from getting signs back twelve years ago when we were playing those games. <laughs> uh, you know all those sign functions. I got signs when in my talk yesterday. Yeah. Just uh, sign of z. Uh, sign of z. Yeah, sign of w dot z. Like things that. like that. Yeah. yeah. Actually, the, yeah. The, this is something I wanted. I wasn't sure whether this was the the place to uh, to erase it, but uh, but may, maybe maybe it is. Um, uh, you know, when 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 you when you look at the amplitudes in twister space, even for uh, even for um, Yang Mills at tree level where everything is supposed to be conformally invariant, it's not quite conformally invariant. And you see these not quite conformal invariances by the appearance exactly of these. I mean, of the, the, the amplitudes at low points are all signs, but on top of everything, there are signs involving the infinity twisters. Um, uh, so they're sort of almost invariants, but they're not, not quite. And that's related to the fact that the tree amplitudes are also not exactly conformally invariant. They have uh, the 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 conformal. Uh, the, there's a conform. There, there's the there's the conformal anomaly, which is just the. Uh, it's just a whole morphic anomaly in this case. For example, the action of the conformal special conformal transformations on MHV amplitudes have some d bar of one over z uh, in them. Uh, so so anyway, in the collinear regions, the amplitudes are not quite uh, exactly conformally invariant. Um, and, uh, and while in momentum space, you can say, well, I'll just avoid those regions and not uh, talk about them. When you do the transform to twister space, it's unavoidable, you hit them. And so you get the decorations of the amplitudes by these uh, signs involving the infinity twister. I was wondering what the analog of that is for the celestial amplitudes, because um, uh, you might also think that, um, uh, yeah, you might, you might think that, that, that something like that should, should uh, Happen to you? Um, uh, did maybe maybe Nasia in your paper where you were uh, talking about transforming uh, MH3 amplitude or or general uh, Yang Mills amplitudes? Did you guys think about what the action of the conformal symmetry is on um, on sp of special conformal symmetry is on the uh, celestial amplitudes? In our paper, we step out of your explicit representation of generator. I, well, I thought that's well understood, right? Which symmetry, yeah. And uh, what, what, yeah. what is it that, is, is there anything? Uh, the, is there, second is there any the second derivatives, the second yeah. derivatives, and they should yeah, be The generator is all written, right? Yeah. But there's no funny anomaly associated with them. You can sort of. Uh, uh, oh, that we haven't really looked, yeah. That, yeah, kind of like an ordinary. Uh, Momentum yeah, I mean, yeah, that ordinary be, but, there's, there's, a, there's an anomaly that's uh, that's uh, localized on the collinear limits. So you might think there's some anomaly that's that's localized at some delta squared of, of I mean, at some delta function where z's collide on the celestial sphere. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, given that the, we know the formulas for generators, we know explicit formulas for the amplitude th that could be looked at. Yeah. But I don't think we looked at it. But the, the ex, there are explicit formulas for all the generators and all that. So um. I'm just wondering if, if there's a, the reason I'm asking, I'm wondering if there's some, I mean, normally these sort of, uh, 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 yeah, I'm saying all of this because 
ordinarily in ordinary CFT philosophy, we don't care about delta functions, you know, things that are localized at coincident points. Um, but here, uh, things localized at, at, at coincident points are collinear limits and we care about them a lot. So there, there should be something important about some kind of delta function localized to, you know, to mm -hmm. when two Zs collide um, that, uh, that is universal and is somehow captured by the uh, collinear limit. And it would be really interesting if there was some, if there was some uh, CFT-ish reason, well, not for ordinary CFTs, we don't care about these things on coincident points, but here, maybe there is a reason we care about these things at coincident points. Uh, um, uh, I, I had a somehow. Sorry? Yeah. No, as I say, I had a slightly different perspective on the infinity twister signs because the um, uh, uh, one of the first reasons why they had to be there was was simply to get the uh, symmetries of the three point uh, Yang Mills amplitude right. Uh, and so in twister space, that happens because the um, uh, uh, the, the, you know, just a skew symmetry happens because you right. wedge product of three one for three four by right. one for right. and so so I was really sort of interpreting them as in, uh, being associated with a check cover and so so, so so and there may be some moral for this in other contexts but uh, you know if you're doing conformal field theory a long way away from the sort of from from, from where you expect it to be um, single valued and everything. Then maybe there is some question of um, choosing a cover and uh, uh, and those signs being associated with sort of making the, those covers consistent. Or, or I'll, I'll make I'll make a, 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 a this is a quicker uh, amplitude uh, statement, but um, uh, but anyway, maybe it's been studied in the interim, but uh, I I don't know of it. It would be really fascinating if one could go back and include all those signs. Um, properly, and even at tree level, if we can understand whether the signs always, you know, when you build the amplitudes with BCFW, let's say, is it true that the signs are always on the outside of the diagram somehow, and not, they, they don't sort of, uh, they don't uh, penetrate the uh, uh, interior in some complicated way, but if they just sort of sit, sit on the outside. Um, that was the, I mean, at the low enough points that we looked at it way, way, way back then, that was, that seemed, seemed to be the case, but there was no systematics of it. If it's somehow associated with the, with the, the breaking of conformal symmetry um, from things going out to infinity, you would expect it to somehow be, uh, be, be attached to the, to the legs going out to uh, infinity in some, in, in, I mean, in some. I, I, I would I, I would agree it's like that they're, they're likely to be superficial because they're likely to be you know on the outside and, and, and because they are just statements about the um, uh, check you, you know the different open sets you're using to, 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 to uh, uh, well uh, uh, check presentation of, of, of the uh, uh, wave functions that you're using and they have to jump when you cross. From one right. set to another. Weren't these sign factors explained by the contour orientations in your link representations or something? In your paper, you can compute them that way, but uh, but there is no. I mean, then and, and in fact, they're very annoying. They're very annoying. You drag them around everywhere. They're uh, and and. Um, uh, and there's a, indeed, I mean, that there's a very, very specific contour. And if you chose that very, very specific contour, they would come along uh, everywhere. But um, yeah, and, and in fact, uh, if, you, if you just follow the, like, uh, the rules for gluing things together via BCFW, it's definitely not manifest that they stay on the inside of the diagrams. It's just that you could do a lot of square moves and things like that and move them eventually so they got to the outside of the diagram. That's why it sounds like an interesting question to try to see if there's some, maybe along the lines that Lionel is saying, maybe there's some a priori understanding for where, where they have to be. But uh, in any case, there is a concrete question whether when you, when you build the amplitude using, let's say, BCFW, whether uh, it's possible to always uh, move them to the outside to, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, but they're, they were annoying things. They were not, they, I mean, at least, yeah.
But I, I bring it up because that the, there is a, the, I mean, I think it's still a conjecture that um, that if you take any sort of uh, Yangian invariant that has the correct collinear limits, it's the amplitude. So sort of, uh, so, you know, uh, asking the correct collinear limit is an enormous constraint on the, on uh, if you want to think of some ab initio determination of what the, the uh, tree amplitudes are. And that's why it would be great to know the analog of that for celestial amplitudes. Oh, maybe I can ask one more question to the celestial uh, experts. Um, uh, in the two, two signature papers, is there finally some sort of beautiful formula for the three-point amplitude or, or not? Are the three-point amplitudes now sort of perfect things or are they, uh, is there still some subtlety associated with them? Take them to different bases and get nicer looking expressions. But at the end of the day, it is the same object. Well, but, but I mean, uh, so I, I bring it up just because if you like try to, obviously if you try to do the official Minkowski space transform, you get zero because the amplitude yeah. is zero in the Minkowski space. So, so but, um, but uh, there must be, is there some, what, is there still some dependence on on, uh, yeah, uh, is there one object in, uh, to, like, let's say I, I fix the helicities. Um, I, uh, at least the way I just start thinking about the 2-2 two -two amplitude, you'd still have to make some choice for who has positive and who has negative energies on top of choosing this. Uh, once you choose the uh, helicities, there's still some analog of in and out uh, choice. So is there, but is there some sort of simple way of uh, relating them all? Well, maybe, maybe someone, if someone knows the story, can they summarize the story for three-point amplitudes in for the celestial sphere? I don't think there's a single answer that continuously takes you from one incoming outgoing orientation to another one. I see. Except for the, I mean, the original celestial amplitude that Sabrina, Shu Heng, and Andy derived as just theta functions that contain these epsilon sign factors and you can choose whichever one you want, but they're not related in a continuous way to each other. But so, so, so then uh, in two, two, uh, I have particles one, two, three, and I still have to decide uh, which two are plus and who's minus or even, yeah, and then, for such a choice, there is some uh, there is some uh, amplitude. Mm -hmm. And but is it possible, to, at least having made that choice, to um, uh, is it possible to sort of directly impose the uh, Poincaré symmetry on the celestial amplitude to determine the amplitude rather than Mellon transforming it? You can definitely do this at the level of the OPE. You can definitely do this. Thanks to you. Hey. At the level of the OPE, you can. So there is this story that we told a couple of years ago saying that the OPE coefficients were fixed by like the subleading soft theorems. And actually, you can just use Poincare symmetry and you treat, you treat, you know, so the Lorentz transformations or the global conformal generators and all you add are the translations and they can be represented as sort of more exotic 2D charges that shift the dimensions. And then you can use those and get all, you know, massless three point functions like you would. A, a little I mean, question, uh, even at three points, uh, don't you get shift relations? D is there some boundary condition which is needed to totally determine them? I, I thought uh, I thought that Poincaré turns into like a, 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 a shift relation statement when you shift delta, right? Like, uh, right. like so, so the answers are always beta functions, right? And right. they're sort of two um, two recursion relations that then once you assume so, a little bit more about the analytic properties, uh, I guess give we you have the, the analog function. of that for the actual amplitude too, because uh, uh, because we, we, we can always write the amplitude either with the uh, angle brackets or upside down with square brackets. 
and purely at the level of uh, transformation properties, they're identical, but one of them blows up in Minkowski space and the other one does not. I'm just curious yeah. what the, but, but where that blowing up in Minkowski space is hidden in the celestial. Maybe it's hidden in the, in the boundary condition you assume for solving the recursion relation. Uh, so no, that in at least the analysis that we did, we assumed, uh, we assumed a singularity stru structure which picked one of them. On the other hand, there's some okay. been some interesting work by um, like uh, Banerjee, a series of papers where they don't, so all we used, right, was essentially the global parts of the symmetries. Um, but of course we know that there are the infinite dimensional, like there's the super translations and the Vera Soro and, and, and so on for the other ones too. And there, you know, you can do, you can use the local parts of it to derive, uh, you know, differential equations. And my understanding is that there, they actually use that to, um, they derive the singular structure. They, they, they somehow, I don't actually fully understand this, but my understanding is that they, they are able to use this sort of local part to, to fix the, which one you're supposed to talk about. That has to be something, I mean, but it must have something to do with going to, uh, to Minkowski space and it's something being sensible. Yeah, something being sensible when Z bar is a complex conjugate of Z, but they also have to vanish when Z bar is a complex. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a little, yeah, anyway, that, um, yeah. yeah. So, so how do we see this additional, this additional degree of freedom that we can have, say for free car, say operator that we can have Yang nodes and F cube uh, structures? Sorry, can you repeat it again? It's, there's a feed. Sorry, yeah, there's some residence. I'm not sure what, uh, um, I think, how I do think we see this? This is just the same as usual, that, that, that the, uh, the helicities are still there as, uh, as labels. And so the, uh, so yeah. So that, that you get a different answer for all plus and two plus and one minus. Okay, and did we see a different mass dimension? Like how do we see, how does that arise? Okay, yeah. I see. Oh, yeah, right. So there's a way where you can, you can say like, I have a three point coupling with a particular bulk four dimensional mass. So ah, you, okay. you fix the two spins and then you say they couple via a particular you know, mass dimension and then that tells you what the third spin is. That's one way to say it. Or you say there's three, yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. By the way, who are the people who are actually in Corfu right now? Were there any Corfu locals on this call? I'm just, I'm just curious. Oh, there's none of, of the participants. No I, yeah, wow. I think so Tom that's, wanted that's, to go there. I, I was that's uh, really, I was that's really great. That so, so th this is this is really a novelty to have a, to have a meeting in this. I mean, maybe we should say that we have. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, uh, another another topic. Uh, I, I, the I, I, Fiji I meeting that. on amplitude, or the yeah, uh, yeah. the Mount Everest meeting on uh, amplitude. Yeah, that that I was. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was supposed to go to the Beyond the Standard Model. When I, they invited me to this model, Beyond the Standard Model, so uh -huh. I was yeah. going to there and participate in person in the other the workshop on this one remotely from Corfu. Okay, right. but I at the end everything fell apart. Right. Well, yeah, but with, I think that this is a this is a this is a, uh, this is a great new development, right? We should just choose the most the most fancy, you know, exotic, beautiful places and have our remote conferences there with nobody present, you know, just. <laughs> yeah. I can't help but feel a little cheated. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I, I, yeah, I was telling, uh, um, yeah, telling uh, uh, Stefan, uh, 
in the beginning of, of the call that it was always my childhood dream to go literally to a Corfu. So I'm uh, so I will find a way to make it there. Maybe next year. So maybe we will have again this workshop, or it depends. Right. Maybe we try next year. Hey Lionel, do do you remember uh, or did did you know Gerald Durrell? I remember the, the, the name. name I, 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 yeah. Sorry, he, can you remind he, me? He's like you? a he's like a, a a biologist slash zookeeper. Uh, um, a British biologist slash uh, uh, zookeeper who ran this very cool zoo somewhere in, in England. I don't remember where. Um, but anyway, he wrote these incredible books on natural history, um, which I devoured as a child. And he grew up in Corfu. And uh, so, and, and, and he said that Corfu was the greatest place for wildlife he'd ever seen in his life. So that's, uh, that's why I really wanted to go. Is, there any, is it still there? You know, it's well. Sorry, yeah, I well, ask one of those depressing type right. questions. Right. <laughs> yeah. Now I did go once for a holiday that was cold and wet. Uh, oh. So, but, but, but so don't go in April. All right. Very good. Uh, all right, guys. I alas have to head out. But uh, thank you very much. Um, thanks for putting this uh, together, um, guys. And uh, okay, yeah, so I'll, I'll try to get some of the talks tomorrow. Okay, thanks uh, a lot, Nima, for uh, coming to Corfu. Yeah, really, uh, I'll really come again for your, sure. All right, great. I really enjoyed your, um, your discussion. And uh, so maybe if, if uh, I don't see any more questions, so also it's getting late. Um, 